community. Activating parks with community programming and amenities correlates with increased park usage, engaging more New Yorkers in their local green spaces. Parks and community green spaces have historically fulfilled a basic human need for connection to self, family, and friends, to community and neighborhood, and to nature. Indeed, many study participants described connecting with nature as an important motivator for visiting their local parks. As a further demonstration of the success <clears throat> of this approach, we were thrilled to announce 20 additional parks that will receive significant investment through CPI in 2024 and 2025, a total investment of over $100 million across the five boroughs. I want to thank Mayor Adams for granting me the privilege of leading this agency and the opportunity to work with each of you to continue improving our parks and open spaces for all New Yorkers. Many of you are very familiar with our hardworking borough commissioners and their district teams who work alongside our dedicated central agency division staff to deliver for New Yorkers every day. We are always available to answer questions and address concerns from your offices and are happy to hear your thoughts on any topic, whether it regards a local park in your district or a citywide agency policy. New York City Parks looks forward to continuing our close partnership with the Council in order to create a bright, green future with a more equitable, inclusive, and resilient park system for all. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and would now be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for your testimony, for your leadership. Uh, I also want to recognize we've been joined by Council Members Nurse and Carr. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions and turn it over to my colleagues uh, to ask their questions. Uh, let's first talk about the workforce itself. As I mentioned in my testimony, we've seen an unbelievable decrease in our parks headcount over the last half a century and in the last year itself. But I really want to understand what that means. So at a very basic level, can you first talk about what do our city parks workers do in our parks each day? What are their res job responsibilities? What is their role? Um, and what is the impact of losing more than 650 workers through these pegs? Thank you, Chair Christian, for the question and for recognizing the importance of our um, Park workers, they are critical assets, as you know, um, in our parks, in their districts across the city, in every single borough. Um, our, I'm going to let my um, deputy commissioner talk about the very specific activities that they do throughout the day, um, but there is no doubt they are critical to building communities and taking care of our parks. Um, we did, as you said, we took a 5% reduction, both FY24 November plan and the FY25 preliminary plan. Uh, but due to the success of these efforts to identify savings, we have not been asked to identify further savings in the FY24 executive um, or April plan. I'm um, happy to say the agency's seasonal hiring plan has been approved, which means that over 3,000 seasonal employees will be brought on board for this summer season to keep our parks clean and safe, including maintenance and operations staff, recreation staff, lifeguards, etc. In terms of some of the specifics of what our MNO staff does on the ground, I'm going to hand that over to um, to Mark Folk, our Deputy Commissioner. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Deputy Commissioner. Mark Folk, Deputy Commissioner, Chief Operating Officer for Parks. Thank you for the question, Councilman. Um, you mentioned in your testimony our city parks workers, CPW, which are the entrance level. Give me the mic a little closer. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Which are the entrance level position. Our city park workers, CPWs, are the entry level position in our maintenance and operations staff. They're the folks that you're most likely to see in the park every day. They're responsible for, for basic grounds maintenance, which is litter and trash removal, responding to turf and horticultural conditions in the warmer months, responding to snow and ice removal in the colder months, responsible responding to graffiti, removal of broken glass. It's the basic park maintenance. It's also keeping our over 680 public restrooms stocked with toilet paper and cleaned. Thank you. Uh, and I first want to know, we've also been joined by Council Member Sandra Ong virtually and Council Member Lincoln Ressler. Uh, so is it fair to say that our parks workers are di directly responsible for cleaning 
all aspects of our parks every single day. Yes, that is fair to say. And is it fair to say that we need more parks workers to fully staff and clean our parks? Uh, thank you, Council Member, for the question. You know, um, we are committed, as you know, as an agency to um, deliver on our core mission to take care of our parks. And we will get that done uh, with whatever resources we are provided. We have really hardworking, dedicated folks on the ground. You know, you see them every day in your parks. They're going to do all that they can to make sure our parks are clean and well maintained. And I do appreciate they can do all, they're going to do all they can. And I do know that, too. Uh, I'll, I'll say, I think it is fair to say that we need more parks workers um, to support our parks to fully staff them. So, Commissioner, can you give a sense of then if we lose 106, uh, sorry, 650 workers as we are uh, with these positions being eliminated due to both pegs, what is the impact of that? What will it mean? Will we have, for example, our bathrooms fully open um, uh, at regular hours? Uh, will they all be open at all, at all times that they should be? What is the impact on a park level of losing this much in terms of headcount? Um, thank you, Council Member, for the question. Um, there is you know, no doubt that there will be um, impacts. We are committed to keeping our bathrooms open. All our bathrooms will be open. Um, they'll be open until dusk. Um, that is, we know that that's a really important amenity for New Yorkers, uh, as you mentioned um, earlier on, for kids and families who are very committed to keeping our bathrooms open, and they will be open uh, through this summer season um, until dusk. As I said, um, we will be relying on our pop workers, on our seasonal workers that will start coming in, 3,000 of them. So we're very committed to maintaining our bathrooms, keeping them open, available to New Yorkers. But what will not be done as a result of 650 positions being eliminated? We'll be looking to, you know, cover as we have done in the past. We'll be looking to um, move people, move resources where they're most needed, deploy staff where we can in order to get the job done as best we can with the resources that we have available. So is it fair to say you'll be making do as best you can given these cuts? Yes. Making do being the operative word uh, or words there. Let me give one example. There's a second shift program. There are 100 hotspot sites through the city identified as parks uh, that need a second shift of services. Can you explain what it means to be a hotspot park and will the second shift program continue as a result of these pegs? Thank you, Council Member, for the question and for recognizing uh, the importance of this initiative. Yes, the second shift was a program that we started last year um, specifically to target, as you said, 100 hotspot sites. In, it's 100 hotspot sites <clears throat> in 62 parks across the city. The idea is to have workers um, from Thursday through Monday uh, into the late afternoon and evening hours um, in order to cover high maintenance areas. Uh, we all know them, barbecue sites, um, places where people congregate in our busiest parks. Um, because of the necessary um, savings reductions, we were forced to make some very difficult decisions as an agency. And so it was necessary for us to reduce currently uh, vacant year-round positions. So due to the, the staffing impacts, we'll not be able to provide targeted second shift maintenance coverage. Um, but as was done prior to establishing this new initiative, we will be um, continuing to maintain heavily used sites um, as we have in the past. We'll be using our pop workers, our seasonal workers. We'll shift staff as needed um, to be able to provide the care and maintenance of these sites. And what, just go back to your testimony of what you just said. So what does that mean when you, with the elimination of the second shift program for these 100 parks in concrete terms, Thursday through Monday, they had an extra shift. How many hours was that shift? And what does that mean? That what will be eliminated for those five days when you don't have the second shift program? Um, thank you, Council Member, for the question. And as I said, um, what we'll be doing is what we did prior to having a second shift. We'll be moving personnel around um, and we'll be covering those, what we know are those very high maintenance sites, the hotspot sites, with existing staff, with POP with our seasonal workers through overtime um, in order to make sure that we can maintain those very busy sites. Will the second shift then remain as a result? In other words, by moving resources, will they get the same amount of hours um, of cleaning and maintenance? 
uh, they will not be exactly the same hours as the dedicated second shift, but we will be covering um, those cleaning responsibilities and those maintenance responsibilities as best we can with existing resources. So best you can, making do, it won't be the same as having the second shift program. Another important point I think you mentioned was you'll be pulling other resources with existing ones to make do for a second shift program that will no longer exist, correct? Correct. Which is, means that you'll be taking away resources dedicated to other programs or parks uh, within the parks department, taking those resources away to make do as best you can in a second shift program, is that correct? Um, thank you for the question, Council Member. As Parks always has done, we will be working hard with the workers that we have who are incredibly dedicated um, to getting the job done and we'll be providing that coverage that they can to, yes, to cover these um, difficult spots. Thank you. Spots. I'll just, you know, summarize, you know, I know we've been joined by Council Members Palladino um, and Council Member Menon on Zoom. Uh, it doesn't add up. If there are 60, 650 worker positions missing, a second shift program being cut for 100 park sites throughout our city, having to pull resources, robbing Peter, in other words, to pay Paul, taking from one area of the Parks Department to cover another. This is not the way our Parks Department should be operated or funded. Can you also explain the difference between having a seasonal and full-time workforce? What, what do full-time workers do and what do the seasonal workers do? Thank you for the question, and um, it is the difference between people who come in at our busy season. We have always had a seasonal program um, so that we have uh, uh, personnel that we can deploy in the busiest times of the year. So our seasonal personnel generally comes on board um, from May through September, about that, about 3,000 staff, as I said, will be deployed as a, um, on a seasonal basis. So they come in just for that period of time and they're hired just for that period of time versus full-time staffing mm -hmm. that is with us um, year-round, day in and day out. Is it fair to say that the Parks Department is relying more uh, on seasonal workers um, than full-time workers at this point, given the pegs? They have all, the Parks Department has always heavily relied on seasonal workers. Um, they're an important part of how we get things done and uh, will continue to be. And my last few questions before turning over to my colleagues. What is the budget and actual headcount for FY 2019 and FY 20, uh, through uh, FY 23? I believe, just bear with me one second, Matt's going to make sure that I get to the right. All right. And if you can, how much was seasonal, how much was full-time? Thank you. I'm getting, um, um, so council member, can you just tell me again your question? Sorry. What is the budgeted and actual headcount for fiscal tw uh, 2019 through fiscal 2023 in terms of full-time and seasonal? Okay, so for um, FY19, full-time was 4,292, seasonal was 3,337. You want to go through each of these numbers? FY20 was 4,407. Seasonal was 3,558. FY21, 4,299. Seasonal was 2,629. Uh, FY22, 4,356. Seasonal, 4,460. And FY23, 4,830. Seasonal, 3,387. So substantial reliance on seasonal workers um, as opposed to full time. Finally, as of right now, how many positions will be expiring in July? Uh, bear with us one second. Um, thank you for the question. I can't give you an exact answer because it's based on attrition. So Let me ask our commissioners, is there, those, there, those that are funded by one shot uh, uh, agreements, yeah. how many okay. are uh, expiring in July? Sorry for the confusion. Yeah, sorry, I um, and as you look, these are positions that are funded one time only uh, in the current fiscal year and that expire every June 30th. Yes. Um, in terms of the... Um, Playfair, the one-shot funding, uh, it's about 110 positions. Thank you. And what are these positions, and how many of them are currently filled? 
So for the one-shot um, council ads, which we so appreciate and are so important to the agency, um, there were Playfair Rangers, uh, there, were, there was council one-shot funding for 50 one-year Rangers. All FY24 funded positions have been hired. For Playfair Green Thumb positions, the council one-shot funding um, uh, was 2.6 million. 11 positions have been hired and um, uh, those resources are being utilized. And then for the forest management framework funding, that was also Playfair one-shot funding. 51 positions, um, uh, one-shot were funded, um, and uh, a total of 35 were hired across the natural areas management team, and in addition, six existing permanent staff members were stepped up into supervisory roles to support the expanded team. So, I mean, as you can see, it's a number of core positions that are funded by one-shots every year as opposed to baseline full-time staff, and each year we're scrambling to fill those positions. This is the world we're operating in every time when it comes to our parks budget. Uh, finally, there is still a hiring freeze in place for parks, right? What does that hiring freeze mean exactly? Uh, thank you for the question, and you're right, there is still a hiring freeze in place for the parks department, which means that uh, when individuals leave, we're not able to hire. So substantial reliance on seasonal workers, one-shot positions that expire every year, historically low headcount compared to prior decades, and on top of that, a hiring freeze at the present moment. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to my colleagues to ask some questions. Uh, Councilmember Holden. Thank you, Chair. And it's very frustrating that we, we don't seem to be getting anywhere <clears throat> in the budget area of parks, and we don't get close to the 1% that we've been fighting for and that the mayor agreed um, when he was running, when he was campaigning, to fund parks at 1%. Um, and I've been doing this now in, with parks. I just counted the years. It's 50th, my 50th year working with parks. Um, don't, don't have to laugh at that one. But. <laughs> So that's your 25. So. I'm, get, I'm, getting, I'm getting harassed over here. Uh, so I'm proud of that. I'm proud of my um, working with parks. And I remember when we renovated Juniper Valley Park, as the park went, the neighborhood went. That meaning the par all of a sudden the, the surrounding, once we renovated Juniper Valley Park, the area around it flourished. That means people took better care of their property, they had a better investment in the neighborhood. They recognized that. And it was amazing to see within a decade, uh, there was a marked difference. And the, the battle, though, was maintaining the capital project with the park, which we always still, to this day, have a problem with maintenance, because we don't have enough maintenance workers, like, like the chair was talking about. Um, so it's kind of a you know, we had to scrounge really for workers. We had to get volunteers to help maintain it. Uh, and one program that we did have, and I worked with some of the, um, the people on alternate sentencing in our courts and the DAs, we worked, I had to work with the DA's office and they would give me people who were, let's say, caught doing graffiti. Uh, they had to, we had to supervise them in the park and they would work a certain amount of hours and, I, and we would supervise them. Is that still happening? Because, you know, again, we ha th it's a shame that we have to go to this. We shouldn't have to, but we do have to kind of use all the methods possible for funding our parks. Thank you, Council Member Holden, um, for the question and for the support of our parks over those 50 years. I know you've made a real difference and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, the support of the council is, is so important. Um, we absolutely um, rely on a whole manner of different volunteers um, and actively work with um, many different uh, groups across the city um, and engage them in our park system. There is no doubt that volunteers help us get the work done, but we also also fully believe that it's also good work to engage in. It helps to build community, helps to reduce loneliness. Um, so as I said in my testimony, uh, we started counting last year through our Let's Green NYC initiative and we've um, engaged over 460,000 volunteers in our parks. All right, but on the alternate sentencing, because it stopped during the pandemic and then okay. it took, still we're tr I was trying to restart it. Last year's hearings, you know, I asked the DA and they weren't sure. And, did, yeah. you know, is it, did it start up? Because I really can't get a definitive. 
answer on this. I, um, I would need to follow up on, with you on that. I know that we used a similar program when I was in Prospect Park. Good, because I hear, you know, the, the Queens Parks people are like family to me. I mean, I, I've watched them grow up, actually. <laughs> um, and I, I, I remember when they came in, Phil Sparaccio was a young, you look like a teenager. But, ne you know, again, he's, and he's still with us. And yeah. he's still, and I still keep in touch with him every, almost every single day. Yeah. And uh, so I asked him this question, too. And, you know, so I, but he would ask me, he would say, can we get the program restarted? Can we get the, that program restarted? Because it really helped us clean up the parks and, and help us. So again, if you can make that a priority, if it's not happening, mm -hmm. uh, I'll talk to the DA's office. Um, also, you know, just creative capital, uh, which I'd love to, because I get corporations or I get even Major League Baseball interested in an investment in, in capital. Mm -hmm. Do you have a public-private partnership where I could take some city money and some private money to renovate our, our, our ball fields, let's say, just in case of Major League Baseball. Yeah, thank you for the question and so appreciate it. We do work actively with a whole number of um, various corporations. We have something called the Adopt-A-Park program that has been a very successful way for us to bring um, public and private money together. So Nike, the NBA, we've worked with a number of different organizations. So yes, we could absolutely be happy to talk to you about that program and uh, find a way. Because I did ask the capital people and they said, well, it's only if they fund it. I said, well, no, I, what if I did 50-50? Mm -hmm. You know, can, mm -hmm. do you do that? No? You, you kind of went like that. Yeah. Like if a city right. process it, kicks in. Yes, exactly. If it's city money, it has to go through the city process, absolutely. So, so we, we don't, we could do 50-50 if... Well, sorry. If I'm yes, go ahead. I mean, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, so certainly there can be joint funding, but just just signaling that if any city dollars are involved, like the the entirety has to run through the city's procurement process, if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, it goes through procurement, but that, I got a roadblock when I suggested it, the capital, uh, parks capital. Sure, I mean, I think there are, par I think in a, in a lot of ways it's a little cleaner and Because I'd like to will. know some creative, you know, past projects you've done that I could now you know, look at and say, I'll model that mind after that, you know? Yeah, no, I think we're always open to conversations and I think it's a, it's a obviously on a case by case basis. I did basis, speak to the Mets, they're interested. I did, you know, I'm speaking to, I'm tr I'll even try NHL, anybody soccer, you know, just to get projects done in a sure. timely fashion and maybe funded. Yeah, I'll just note that mostly those projects right. are wholly, right. so you know, you, the private you have some, yeah, okay, project. just, a, I'm sorry, did I run out of time? <laughs> I, I did. That's right. Uh, <laughs> just one, just one more. Actually, um, two more. Because <laughs> um, I asked about this last time, stump removal contracts, are we, do we have that going? We do, yes. All right, because I'm backlogged have, yep, 30 the, years yep. in stump removal. Yes, we do have a stump removal <laughs> contract. Really? There is a backlog. I, mean, I, can yeah. tell, I can show you when I was a kid, some of these trees came down, the stumps are still there. Uh, so again, I, they're just landmarks now. But what, what I, so if we, we do have that, that going, um, the, just an update, because I, I always ask you this, on the in-house tree planting pilot program that you were creating, yes. um, how is that, what, are we going to expand it? Yes, thank you, for the, and stuff thank like you that. for the question, and it is an important um, pilot project for us, and it's part of our uh, work that we're doing to reduce the cost of um, uh, tree planting across the city. We do have the pilot that it is getting up and running. Um, we need to have it run for a period of time to figure out if it is going to be successful, but we, it is an important um, initiative that we're trying to find alternative methods for planting yeah, trees. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member. And before moving to our next Council Member, you know, one question on the point that Council Member Holden mentioned is another impact of all of these pegs has been the delays in capital projects uh, that have been pushed out further. We're already seeing long extended timelines for parks projects, but one I wanted to highlight, for example, is the High Bridge Recreation Center, where there's a pool wall stabilization project in Washington Heights that was rolled from fiscal 2024 to 2030. So 24 to 2030 in the preliminary commitment plan. This is an $894,000 project that has been rolled five years into the future. Why was this project moved into the out years? So essentially, um, a council member, it was an accounting exercise to free up space related to the city's bond borrowing limit. But the capital rolls did not affect any active capital projects. 
But the pegs did push out projects for into the out years, correct? No, um, there was a, um, it was announced a 14% peg to the capital um, uh, plan, but Parks worked with OMB to identify savings. So the majority um, of the savings were from what are called lump sum IDs, uh, money that had not yet been broken out to discrete projects, essentially mayoral dollars. So the eventual reduction was 10.9%, not 14.3%. And so it was mayoral money that had not been um, spent or allocated, so it does not affect any present projects. I see. Uh, next up, we'll have Council Member Nurse. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the cuts and the impacts. Um, I have Highland Park and then I have parks in Brooklyn. And Highland Park, which I, I shared at one point, I think, with Council Member Holden, uh, maybe not anymore, beautiful. Dude, a lot of PEP officers, full maintenance crew, never have any complaints there. When we were able to get another shift of PEP folks, all complaints stop. On the Brooklyn side, it is the bane of my existence, my Brooklyn parks. It is nonstop. Uh, all of, the, every single one of my parks can never be closed. There are pools of urine all the time feces, needles, trash, ev every single week, parties till one in the morning. At every single time we have a call with parks, what's the plan? There is no plan, we have no capacity. Can you, can you give me a design for doors that we can invest in so that we don't have to send the precinct every night to go close the park when they have other things to do? Uh, sure, we'll get you things, nothing. So we're buying locks, I'm buying locks out of my own money, motorcycle chains, the precinct is buying them, they're getting cut repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. And I just feel like you're being very nice, Chair, in saying, you know, what will this look like? It just looks disgusting. It looks like my parks are disgusting, and on one side in Queens, it's beautiful, and the other side, it's not. And I just, we have nothing to offer to any of my community leaders, to the school leaders who are, opening the school every morning, and it just looks disgusting. There's nothing we're able to offer them. And I just want to know what's going to be different this time. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you, Council Member, for the question. And I'm sorry to hear there should absolutely not be a differential between your Queens Parks and your Brooklyn Parks. There's absolutely no reason for that, and it shouldn't exist. Um, we do um, have a limited number of PEP officers. We do deploy them where they're, we try and deploy them where they're most needed. Um, we can absolutely work with you and look at deploying them, you know, in these Brooklyn parks. I will say that late night activity in parks, crime in parks, is the purview of NYPD, and we work in close partnership with PD on uh, activity like that. So it needs to be a combination of our PEP officers and PD working in partnership. Whose job is it to close the parks? Uh, it is, generally it is the parks department, but we have many parks that NYPD does close on our behalf. When we have a small precinct with very few officers on the ground. So when it's parks jobs to close the parks, if the park could actually be closed, it would be it for the complaints. Mm -hmm. They would cease to exist. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm asking for either more PEP officers in North Brooklyn, mm -hmm. because when we call, it's about two to three hours before anyone can show up. Mm -hmm. So that looks like me and some folks going down at one in the morning, knife fights are happening, mm -hmm. there's generators everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't like to come here and say this. I know you all as individuals would love more money, but just to really illustrate, and you all know this, I mean, we've been talking about it for two years. Mm -hmm. So it would just, you know, if there's a infrastructure fix, for some of these gates, make them stronger, make them harder, you know, something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. I think many members would be willing to invest in that out of our, out of our funding pots. Mm -hmm. But we need some kind of solution because all we're being told is call the cops. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's your job to close the park. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's your job to say we need more PEP officers here mm -hmm. in these hearings. Mm -hmm. It's not just we'll make do. It's like we, this is what we have. We got 12 people in the whole borough of Brooklyn doing enforcement. Mm -hmm. That's wild to me. Mm -hmm. But in Queens, there's three officers at any given time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it, there is a huge disparity. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I feel like we're banging our heads on the wall mm -hmm. and I got nothing to show for it. Mm 
for two years of being here, I have nothing to show this community other than I'll go buy another lock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I so. hear you, and I, we absolutely don't want that to be the case. We'll follow up directly after this hearing and look at the individual parks that you're talking about and work with the borough and see what we can do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Nurse. Uh, you know, I think Councilmember Nurse raises very serious concerns that also go to what I started out the hearing with my questions in terms of the actual impact of these cuts. If this is the state of things right now with the budget that Parks has making do, I fail to see how conditions will get any better if there are positions being eliminated and there are further and further cuts to our Parks Department. Now, the reality is very stark on the ground when we lose workers uh, and we lose funding for maintenance. Before going to the next council member, just a couple questions. Commissioner, I wanted to follow up on, on the response on, on the capital, because even though the 10.9% capital reduction does not impact current ongoing projects, isn't it true that it would impact the timing and completion of other projects in your portfolio? Uh, no, because again, that was mayoral money that had not been assigned to active projects. So it does not, Im it, 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 it was money that wasn't being utilized for active projects. So it wouldn't Im impact them. So that are in the pipeline or planned for the future would be affected by the pegs. Right. No. I. Uh, more. A couple more questions. More. A couple more questions. Important issue for a number of uh, for all our council members. Uh, how many tree pruners does the Parks Department employ? How many are budgeted uh, each year or for this year? With me one sec, I definitely have this. Um, I claim there's some pruners somewhere. Here we go. What page are we on? Sorry, eight. Okay. Okay, thank you for the question. The agency currently has 80 climbers and pruners and 64 foresters. 80 climbers and pruners and 64 foresters. Do you think that's enough to cover all the trees that need? services across the city? Well, in addition, we also work with external vendors that perform routine street tree block pruning and maintenance. And we're our, at present, we are funded to provide routine pruning on a seven year cycle, which is in line with urban tree canopy maintenance um, in other localities across the country. The seven year pruning cycle is pretty much standard. So how many trees go without adequate pruning every year? Are they being pruned on the schedule of, of every seven years? Uh, is Park sticking to that schedule with the current staffing yes. it has? Yep. Now, the reliance on external contractors, we focused on that in prior hearings. Uh, Dragonetti is a very problematic contractor, uh, indicted, convicted on federal charges uh, related to insurance fraud. Do you feel that there's an adequate workforce when it comes to our trees and, and, and pruning, both within parks um, and uh, with external vendors uh, to adequately prune and care for our trees across the city? Thank you for the question, council member. And we work hard to um, both oversee our existing uh, climbers and pruner, climber and pruner effort. We also are really pleased with the fact that we developed a climber pruner apprenticeship program. Um, the climber pruner title is a very difficult to hire one. Um, and so we've worked hard internally to um, uh, expand that by um, offering a, an apprenticeship program to add to our ranks, which we're excited about. Um, uh, we have also worked hard to bring in more MWBE contractors into the fold in terms of our tree planting efforts. So we're very much focused on expanding the ranks when and where we can. It's, it's the same way that, that I see it with the full-time versus seasonal workforce. Parks is relying significantly on the seasonal workforce, unable to baseline positions, hire full-time workers. Uh, but with, with our trees and our pruning too, there's a substantial reliance also on external vendors as well, uh, one of which is, is very problematic. And the lack of resources to hire more internally to have on staff uh, more trees and pr uh, uh, climbers and pruners. And so, you know, I, I mentioned that to say, do you think with the pegs, the vacant positions that were eliminated, the 650 positions, was the tree, was forestry impacted at all at this point, or is it still? fully staffed? 
Thank you for the question. And I, I do want to just state that with 5.7 million trees across the city, we would always need external help to take care of our trees. There's no way that we could do that um, today with the staff that we have or the workforce we have. And, and we, need, um, we need support throughout the city in order to really be able to maintain um, that incredibly huge inventory in our urban canopy. One, zooming out for a second to a much larger point. Were there, in your conversations with OMB, were there any pegs that you submitted that were denied? In other words, are these all pegs that you had put forward as the Parks Department were accepted, or were there things that you would also propose as alternatives to these cuts um, that were denied by OMB? These were all pegs that we put forward, yes. And in your conversations with the mayor, as I mentioned before, this was a campaign promise that we are, that he is failing at. We're moving backwards, not forward. What have been your conversations with the mayor and with City Hall about achieving a goal of increasing our parks budget to ultimately 1% of our city budget? Thank you for the question, Council Member. And as I said in my testimony, uh, the administration, we at the agency are very committed to the care and maintenance of our parks. We have regular conversations with the deputy mayor, with the administration, with the mayor about the importance of our parks. And they certainly a strong recognition. Uh, the administration has very recently uh, stated their ongoing commitment to 1% for parks. Um, uh, that has obviously been somewhat delayed given current fiscal realities, but there still is that commitment there. Well, I'm glad to hear the commitment is still there verbally, but as I said, actions speak a lot louder and we're moving backwards as opposed to forward, even in the universe where you're committing a certain amount each year and steadily trying to achieve that goal. Uh, next up is Council Member Carr. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, always good to see you. I just want to start out by saying how much I love my Borough Parks teams. Um, known Borough Commissioner Rick Udone for a long time. Not as long as Councilmember Holden knows the Queens Parkies, but um, had a great collaboration with her always, and I'm learning to value Borough Commissioner Marr greatly in these opening months of the new term now that I have Brooklyn, too. Um, I want to echo my colleagues' comments um, regarding operations and funding in this budget because I think, unfortunately, Parks, maybe more than any of its sister agencies, is constantly trying to figure out how to maintain operational standards with less. Um, and I think you've had some success historically over that, which I think has kind of made you a, an opportune uh, target when OMB has to try to figure out ways to make room in the budget. And I think that's a shame because the truth is, is that we all see in our parks what happens when you don't have the ability to staff up or maintain staff in order to ensure standards. But I want to drill into, um, in particular, the PEPs issue. Um, this is a problem even in good budget years, and it's never gotten the investment it needed, and there's literally no community or borough that doesn't have a PEPs shortfall. So if you could go into a little bit about how you assess your staffing needs, in particular, is there a formula about population, acreage that needs to be covered, et cetera, and are you anywhere close to uh, that standard in any place? And in particular, I'd love to know where you are with Staten Island and South Brooklyn. Um, thank you, Council Member Carr, for your question and for your support of Commissioner Riccadone and the borough staff. I couldn't agree with you more. They're fantastic. Um, so in terms of PEP, um, we, the way that we um, allocate our PEP is really strategically at parks throughout the city. We try and do it as equitably as possible. Um, we monitor park concerns closely and we adjust deployment as we can so we know where there are difficult areas. We move staff when we need it. Um, in terms of our PEPTIS um, division, we're currently funded for a tax levy baseline of 292 PEP officers as well as 79 grant funded officers and 52 administrative support staff. We also, to supplement our PEP staff, we do in the summer season, in the peak season, we bring in um, summer PEP staff, it's called Park Security Service. Uh, so we add um, in, the dip, in the busy times, Memorial Day through Labor Day, we anticipate there'll be 377 additional PEP staff assigned they, you know, for beaches, pools, and parks. Um, in terms of Staten Island specifically, the baseline staff uh, for Staten Island is 37. 37 for a borough who a quarter of which is city parkland. Um, and it's great having all the parkland, but it also increases the burden on PEPs 
to protect these areas, particularly so much of it is passive park and the illegal dumping that happens in so many places, too many places, is just an unacceptable environmental degradation. And unlike an urban park where, you know, we expect NYPD to kind of supplement patrols, I don't, they don't have the vehicles to kind of go into the middle of the green belt and try to see what's going on there. Only PEPs and Parks Department has that. So I think we need to do better there. Um, we can go on about this all day. I want to pivot to, to another issue, which is tree stump removals. Um, can you tell us where we are uh, in, in that regard? And then in particular, also the tree and sidewalk program, um, based on the prelim budget, what level rating do you expect to be working on in, Bar in Staten Island and Southern Brooklyn? Thank you, Council Member Carr, for your question. I'm gonna bring up our, our expert in that area, our Deputy Commissioner for Environment and Planning, Jennifer Greenfall, so she can give you more specific answers. Could we pause the clock as you swear in the new witness? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Please raise your right hand if you're able. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, um, Council Member. And let's see, I think the question was about stumps and- Stump removal. Right, so we have active stump and tree and stump removal contracts. I can get you a number of what the sort of backlog is. We've never been comfortable with that number, and so we're rechecking everything. And so our hope is by the end of this fiscal year, we'll have like a clean number, so we know really what we need. Um, and then uh, trees and sidewalks, we haven't changed our um, rating uh, sort of prioritization. We have a certain number of um, uh, trees and sidewalks that were rated over 80 um, at a particular time, and we're still committing to do those, and anything that comes in over 90 is what we look at to add to contracts. Um, most, if not all, of our, our funding is capital funding, so we have to make sure we sort of stick with those capital eligibility for those, those um, uh, sort of capital clusters, and I can get you specifics in Staten Island uh, to follow up. Thank you, and just briefly, Chair, I, I would just love to know what you need in terms of extra funding to reach different targets, say, moving from 80 to 75, or even very ambitiously to 70, um, because as the borough delegations come up with our particular priorities, it would be good to have a price tag on what we could talk to you about and, and the Speaker's office and the Chair. Absolutely, we can Thank make you. that. Thank estimate you, for you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Councilman McCarr. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. And I just wanted to reiterate, even the number for Staten Island, so for overall, for all of New York City, we have less than 300 PEP officers on staff, right? Correct. Do you believe that that's enough to cover all the parks adequately across our city? Um, as stated, we do the best we can with the resources we have available. Um, have there been any changes since adoption in where PEP officers are stationed across the city? Uh, no, we deploy them, as, a, as I said earlier, we deploy them based on uh, we, um, where they're most needed, hotspot areas, and then um, and the, you know, seasonal staffing, we deploy them to pools and beaches, but no, um, we look to, as best we can, deploy them equitably and where they're most needed. Do you hear often from constituents or council members uh, about PEP officers not being present or the need for more PEP officers? Uh, uh, thank you for the question, Council Member. We hear often how um, important our PEP officers are and what a difference they make in their parks and how important their presence is in terms of enforcing park rules and being a uniform presence in our parks. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Ressler? Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you for your tremendous leadership. I, uh, it's good to see you, Commissioner. Um, you know, I really just want to firstly say thank you on a variety of different fronts in District 33, we've had a really strong working relationship with the Parks Department. And we got turf installed in Cadman Plaza in record time. We've got new containerization projects happening with Brooklyn Parks that we're really excited about. Uh, I am thrilled that we are just beginning to explore major green infrastructure projects in McCarran Park, which could be a major game changer for flooding resiliency in our community in North Brooklyn. Um, and I've been appreciative of your openness and partnership to a redesign of Columbus Park, which we're gonna come back to you on in the very near future with some specifics. I, the thing that we've probably, you know, been most appreciative of the partnership with the Parks Department on though is around our plan to plant 3,400 new tree, street trees over the next few years. And I have to say, 
you know, there were a lot of really bad news stories in the PMMR of city agencies moving in the wrong direction. And the data that you all have to show on the improvement you're making on on tree care and management is really impressive. The number in the PMMR year over year, we saw the number of street trees planted doubled, the number of street trees pruned tripled, uh, total trees planted doubled, excuse me, the number of street trees pruned tripled, and the number of tree inspections almost doubled. Considering the limited resources you all have, like it's a real testament to quality management and we appreciate it. Um, but I am deeply concerned about the like very deep budget cuts that are proposed for FY25. If from our adopted FY24 budget of four, that included headcount of 4,755, the preliminary budget for FY25 is down to 4,101. That reduction is a 16% reduction in parks headcount. And as Councilmember Nurse and others have articulated, we need more people, not less. And I just would hope, and I apologize if I miss this, but could you help me, 650 people, where are we losing those jobs? What headcount is disappearing? Um, so thank you, council member, both for the support of all the, um, our staff in Brooklyn, all the good work that's going on, the tree planting, it's so appreciated and is helping us um, to expand the urban tree canopy, which we really appreciate. Um, in terms of, um, those losses. Um, they will be over time because it's based on attrition. So if we are in a hiring freeze. As people leave, we won't be able to replace staff. Um, but are there any positions that are, um, that are not subject to the hiring freeze? Um, right now, the, for public safety, so our PEP officers are But not. every other position in the Parks Department Yes. When we're losing folks, we're losing folks. Yes. I mean, that's, I mean, even with the two to one that's now in place and the freeze is gone, you're, if this budget were adopted as is proposed by OMB, we would just be losing people for years to come across the Parks Department in valued positions that are doing parks maintenance, that are cleaning, that are making the, the parks improvements happen that we depend on. Those positions are just not getting filled. Yes, the hiring freeze um, is in place for us f until FY26. And so, it's just, there is no world in which we will not experience severe deterioration in the conditions in our parks, no matter the quality of the management, when we're losing 16% headcount across the board. I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of parks. It, it's, they are our collective front yard, backyard in a dense city. They're critical for our resiliency. They're critical for our air quality. They're critical for our joy. And I just think these cuts make zero sense. And it is an unfortunate thing that each and every year now, we're having to play defense on the mayor's nonsensical and deeply harmful budget cuts. Um, and it's on Chair Krishnan and all of us to fight back, to try to just hold on to what we have, um, which as Council Member Nurse said, is not enough. So I am, I'm just angry that anyone would propose this kind of severe, harmful, across the board cuts to our parks. Um, and we're gonna have a lot of work to do over the next few months to try to take care of it and improve it, um, improve this dire situation. Last thing I just wanted to ask is, uh, as an aside, one of the things that we're trying to explore, and I don't mean to put you on the spot on a new thing, but it was featured in the Times, and I think there's a pilot on Roosevelt Island. We're really interested in tiny forests and the impact that they could have. Is this something that you're thinking about Tiny forest. <laughs> yeah. Is this something you're thinking about and is this something that you think we could potentially fund together? I, uh, thank you for that question. I am well aware of the tiny forest concept. I know there's one going in on, uh, Ran uh, not Randall, sorry, Let's Roosevelt call. Island. Um, we're open to finding if there's an appropriate spot for it. We have were approached first and we couldn't identify a spot that sort of fit that particular funder's interest in terms of visibility and a place where it was going to be able to sort of survive for the long term. Well, I want to be the funder. Um, uh -huh. So we've got some ideas for locations in Williamsburg and Greenpoint that we think would be great. Uh, we'd love to explore that together. We'll talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Council Member Ressler, always on top of his tree game. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Ressler. Uh, just two quick follow-ups. Uh, one is the hiring freeze, of course, doesn't apply to lifeguards, right? Right. 
Okay. Just not, no. And have you had any conversations with the mayor, OMB, and City Hall about the possibility of the hiring freeze being lifted in the May executive budget? Um, thank you for the question, Council Member. As I said earlier, it's an ongoing dialogue um, with OMB, with the administration regarding savings, regarding PEGs, um, regarding um, you know how we can move forward. This is an ongoing dialogue, absolutely. But there's a double hit to parks, both in terms of uh, positions being cut as well as a freeze on top of that, too. Uh, Council Member Nurse. Oh, sorry, I think before we go to Council Member Nurse, just uh, Council Member Paladino uh, in first round. Good afternoon and thank you very much. You know how much I love you guys. Everything is great in District 19. I have nothing but the highest praise for all of you. And my parkies are amazing, as well as the volunteerism that we see in the parks. We all know what you're going through and it's really, really rough. I don't know how for a city this large to be coming under such scrutiny. Parks is our, our jewel in every single borough, and as ever, it's been expressed here today, the joy that it brings, uh, it, it's just amazing. So uh, my, my is more uh, concentrated on uh, safety issues uh, concerning dead trees. We have fortunately had had 50 years ago, very many trees planted street lining our, our blocks. And a lot of those trees now are dead. Mm -hmm. and they need to be removed. Uh, biggest complaint that comes to my office concerning parks is trees. Mm -hmm. It's not just the pruning, it's the removal. And we heard it talked about today about the stumps. The tree comes down and then somebody else, another subcontractor has to come in and take down, uh, take out the stump. Being in landscaping, I understand that. We dealt with Bartlett trees. And in doing so, uh, it was also brought up here today about uh, us privately funding, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, our mm -hmm. districts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that right now, out of our discretionary funding, our own pockets, basically the taxpayers' pockets, because this is what they want, mm -hmm. um, I know my office is going to be supplementing uh, a lot of that through my discretionary funding so that trees can get pruned. But also, climbers, I know Forrest, you got a rough, rough hire there. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the climbers and how many do we have and how is that gonna work with forestry? Yes, thank you, Council Member Palladino, for the question and for the support of, of oh, our parkies in Queens and um, for all of our park workers. So right now, the agency currently has 80 climbers and pruners and 64 foresters. And as I said, um, this has historically been, for the Parks Department, a hard-to-recruit title. It's not something that everyone thinks about. Uh, it's a not, a, not an easy job to do huh. or to fill. And so that's why we took on, um, under D.C. Greenfield, the idea of creating a climber pruner apprenticeship program um, so that in-house we could train staff and be able to have them it's, it's a great job um, with the agency and we're excited about the potential of training people in-house to add to um, the ranks of our climbers and pruners in a job that's hard to fill otherwise. At what level can I help you uh, high school like these kids are often looking for everything, something outdoors, something mm -hmm. outside the box. Mm -hmm. And I'm all about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was wondering if there's any kind of apprenticeship that we could set up mm -hmm. in some of our high schools, or at least introduce the idea mm -hmm. of be, make it what it is, it's exciting, yeah. it's you're outside, you're you know, in all elements. And a lot of these people wanna do that, these kids want that. So if there's anything that we could do, if you have any ideas, uh, let me know, and uh, I would love to talk more mm -hmm. in depth with you about this, because again, if we start to take our kids at 16, 17, and put them outside, mm -hmm. doing things cr constructively, mm -hmm. getting actively involved, but seeing results yeah. from their work, you know, that's also very gratifying. Absolutely. It's not something they have to wait right. to see, it's instant, yeah. and I think that, uh, I'm very concerned about our young people, mm -hmm. and I think that if we introduce them to, un, you know, far, it's very difficult. Like I said, when I was in landscaping for over 30 years, it was very hard to find um, uh, local people who wanted to do the work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was somewhat beneath them. Mm 
Mm -hmm. You know, yet my husband was out there every day with the shovel sweating like everybody else. Yep. So, and climbing trees and pruning. Mm -hmm. So this is not new to me, but I'd love to bring in the young people and make it appealing to them. So we'll talk more about that. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. And um, just so you know, Council Member, we do have, we are very um, strong users of the Summer Youth Employment Program. Right. We have over 700 youth that come in in the summers to work in the Parks Department in a whole range of different positions. So that's something we can talk to you about too. It's talk a to citywide program, Absolutely. but very actively utilized by the Parks Department and it gives people a great introduction to the variety of work that we do. So we can talk more terrific. about that. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Paladino. Councilman Nurse. Yes, just a, a few questions. Regarding your PEP hotspots, um, you just mentioned, you know, you deploy them as needed, but what, how do you determine what is a hotspot? What are the, like, kind of thresholds or criteria that you're using to say this is a consistent spot we need to put more uh, resources towards? Um, thank you, Council Member, for the question. We're usually analyzing things like 311 data, where we're getting complaints from the community. Um, we um, have, you know, kind of both um, uh, fixed post people and then uh, folks who are PEP officers who do um, travel. And so we're looking to deploy those resources when and where they're most needed, but also having equitable distribution across the five boroughs. Okay. It would be great in the follow up if we could request what the current hotspots are mm -hmm. across the city so that mm -hmm. the members can know where those more consistent deployments are happening. Mm -hmm. um, and in some relationship to the data that creating that threshold mm -hmm. um, because I, I know for sure that um, and sorry to circle back to my own district problems but I mean I would love to get to the status that my counterparts here are um, that kind of level that they're they're sharing but it would be really helpful to know you know we always try to tell people to do 311 but you know the the thing about 311 is when cases are closed and no one shows up and and, and nothing changes people don't do it anymore mm -hmm. so they just call us instead mm -hmm. and so you know i think criteria and should be added that you know you know outreach from elected officials and community leaders should be counting mm -hmm. towards those thresholds because 311 fails our communities often yeah um, in terms of changing the conditions on the ground uh, and so yeah. I think it would be really helpful for a level of transparency and for our better advocacy to have that information more readily available to mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And I, I will absolutely say that we are very much responsive to when we hear from elected officials, if we hear of a, a situation that's continually difficult, I mean, electeds call me directly, they call borough commissioners, and we do deploy um, our, our, our pet staff based on you know um, inquiries, requests from electeds, from communities, and as well as looking at 311 data. So we use a very broad range of different inputs to be able to deploy the staff. Okay, I would, I, I'm hoping that that translates into changes, at least for my neighborhood. I know I had reached out to you, I've reached out to our Brooklyn commissioner, mm -hmm. I have regular meetings with parks and PD, I would really love to see a change. I'm hoping that me bringing the level of energy I'm bringing in this hearing translates to that. Unfortunately, I wish that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I do think it would be helpful to see how you all make those evaluations. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Chair. Thanks so much, Councilman Nurse. I totally echo Councilman Nurse's uh, concerns. And I think, again, it goes back to the lack of budget you all have, but the importance of also uh, highlighting these issues and finding ways to address them, even with the resources that you have, despite them being limited. I think that data would be really helpful because 300 PEP officers across the whole city, um, I think raises some serious questions and challenges. So it will be good to see how they're divided up, how and based on what data. Um, finally, uh, Council Member Carr had a, fo a follow up and Council Member Paladino. Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioner, I want to talk a little bit about Fresh Kills Park. Um, mm -hmm. North Park is beautiful. It's a wonderful window into uh, the rest of the park. Uh, I still think we need that zip line. Uh, that we'll have to put in there one day, but that, that aside, that aside, um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between parks and sanitation, right? Because you still have this sort of joint custody uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. I know a couple of budgets ago, sanitation kicked in very large with the security um, uh, funding for the site. So can you talk a little bit about, have you assumed any additional budgetary responsibilities for Fresh Kills besides North Park? 
Um, and what's your expectation for the coming fiscal years about how you're going to kind of gradually be taking the financial and other responsibilities from sanitation and how that's going to impact your, your bottom line? Um, thank you, Council Member Carr, for the question. And absolutely agree with you. North Park is fantastic and so exciting. And it gives you a visual of what's to come, which is wonderful. We do have a very close working partnership with DSNY. You're right on the site. It is still an active landfill. And so we need to be respectful of that situation and, and work collaboratively. Um, in terms of the, you know, we, we are um, moving forward with, you know, kind of next phase and thinking about the next phase of capital um, commitment there. In terms of taking more re financial responsibility um, beyond North Park, I don't, I don't think there is um, any more um, financial responsibility we're taking on at this point, although we are very much thinking, forward thinking in terms of the design of the rest of the park. So at this point, there's no set, um pattern or schedule for you to assume any financial burden beyond North Park until those capital right. projects are met. Yes. Right. And when do you think we're going to have a conversation about the confluence and some of these other places that are a little more programmable um, because they're not landfilled? I mean, I yeah, um, we we'll definitely can come back to you on that. We're always open to thinking about how we can move forward. It's a very exciting project for us at Parks, and we're really committed to it. So happy to have those ongoing conversations. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Carr. Before Councilmember Palladino, uh, we do have, unfortunately, need to make a quick detour because we have two students who want to testify, um, and they have a hard dismissal from school at 2.45. So if you all can, we appreciate you, Commissioner and team, staying for uh, their short testimony, and then we can go back to Councilmember Palladino's questions. Uh, we have up you videotaping? Virtual. Hey, everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you for joining. Sorry it took so long. We have a lot of questions, things to go through, but we know you're on a clock, so let's, let's, let's do this. We have both Christian Maya and Daniela Jimenez um, and their parent, Santa Segundo. Uh, so if, um, Daniela, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. My name is Daniela Jimenez. I'm a seventh grade student. I sit one in Da Vinci Middle School located in Corona, Queens, District 24. Thank you to the Parks Committee for allowing me to testify about parks and safe playgrounds. I also want to thank Park Chair Chikar Krishnan for making investments in playgrounds in every zip code in New York City. A big thank you to the NYC Park Commissioner Susan Donahue for supporting New York Parks. I'm here to testify about the park to Flushing Meadow Parks, Corona Park, an area that my friends and family visit to during our spare time. This park is important for my family and friends because we can relax, develop social connections, and have fun, and increase our productivity at school and work. We ask the City Council to invest in our future by allocating 1% of the city budget to the NYC parks, so that our parks and playgrounds can be clean and safe. Mayor Adams committed to these investments, and we ask them to follow through. When kids are in parks, we need access to water fountains, sprinklers, and clean functioning bathrooms. My classmates and I want to feel safe in our beloved community parks. When we see someone who is homeless next to our playgrounds, a person who is struggling and does not have a place to call home, and makes us feel uncomfortable and even sad, our community leaders and elected officials must find compassionate solutions and keep, and keep us safe. The reduced budget resulted in fewer parks workers, making it impossible for the ag agency to ensure parks are safe and clean across the city. My, fr my friends and I often come across trash, plastic containers, and empty alcoholic bottles. There is no police park maintenance personnel to patrol our parks and help us prevent vandalism, which makes us feel unsafe, especially when fights break out. I believe parks should be a place where we can relax, socialize, and have fun. Our local park is underfunded and understaffed. There is not enough park officers which are in the parks to prevent people from smoking or bathing, making it hard to breathe. Please call the park so we can all be safe. We ask the city council to commit to 1% for the parks. Please upkeep the parks across the city, not just for us, for all New Yorkers and those who choose to visit our city and open in public places. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. I love and my kids love Flushing Meadows Corner Park too. So thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up, Christian uh, Maya. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I want to express my gratitude to each and every one of you for being here today. Your presence speaks volumes about your dedication to our community, and it filled me with gratitude and hope. My name is Christian Maya, and I'm honored to stand before you as a seventh grade student from I-61 and a proud member of the Junior Lighthouse Program. I am a passionate advocate for the families of Queens, including my own. Our parks hold a special place in my heart. They are not just spaces, they are the beating hearts of our communities. They are where families gather, children play, and cherish memories are made. However, as we gather here today, I cannot ignore the challenges that our parks face. Broken equipment, littered paths, and neglected areas paint a stark picture of neglect. These issues not only mar the beauty of our parks, but also deprive families of the safe and welcoming spaces they deserve. The safety of our families is paramount, and, I, and it deeply it troubles me to see dangers like broken glass and cigarette smoke threatening our parks. Our families deserve better, and it's up to us to make a change. One of the major obstacles we face is the lack of sufficient funds for parks, maintenance, and improvements. Today, I urge our city to allocate 1% of the budget specifically for maintaining park services. This allocation will ensure that our parks receive the necessary funds to address maintenance issues, improve safety measures, and create a more enjoyable experience for families. Imagine a future where families can gather in clean, safe, and vibrant parks, where tr children's laughter echoes freely, and where our parks reflect to the love and care of our united community. As I embark on this heartfelt journey with you, I am filled with hope and optimism. Together, let's ignite the flames of passion and compassion, knowing that our actions today will shape a brighter and more joyful tomorrow for all of our families. Thank you for joining me in this vital mission. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Christian. It's, you did, oh, both did such an amazing job. IS61 is not too far from my district of Jackson Heights and Elmhurst, Queens, so I'm proud to see both two amazing Queen students, and I really want to say to both of you, uh, and to Ms. Segundo, who's on too, you all, you both did such an amazing job. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. And you stayed on time too, which is hard, difficult for us as council members to do. So thank you so much, and great, great work. And Santa Segundo is now going to testify. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Santa Segundo, soy madre voluntariada de la Escuela Intermedia 61 Leonardo da Vinci, ubicada en Corona Queens, Distrito 24. Gracias al Comité de Parques por permitirme testificar sobre parques y áreas de juego seguras. También quiero agradecer al presidente de, de parques, el señor Di Cristian, para realizar inversiones en parques infantiles de todos los códigos postales de la ciudad de Nueva York. Un agradecimiento al comisionado de parques de Nueva York, Susan Dog, por apoyar a los parques de Nueva York. Nos reunimos aquí hoy por una preocupación común que afecta a cada una de nuestras familias. El estado de nuestros amados parques, como padres, nos esforzamos por brindarles a nuestros hijos un ambiente un ambiente saludable y, y limpio, seguro de donde quedan, puedan jugar, explorar, simplemente ser niños. Sin embargo, la condición actual de nuestros parques es estropeada por basura, plástico, excremento de perros, excremento de personas que encuentran los baños cerrados, de las personas adictas que tienen como el alcohol, las drogas, que no cumplen con los estándares de nuestra comunidad que merece. Nuestros parques comunitarios actualmente están plagados de abuso de drogas, violencia. Es difícil encontrar un parque seguro y saludable. A la mayoría de los bancos están ocupados por personas sin hogar o durmiendo en ellas. Adictos y es muy inseguro para nuestros niños más pequeños ya que no tienen dónde jugar. Hay muchos casos en los que estallan peleas y no hay policías o está la policía y en lugar de intervenir solo dejan pasar. Todo esto sucede frente a nuestros ojos y la de nuestros hijos. Esta comunidad fue la que más sufrió durante el COVID, ya que estamos atrapados en nuestros apartamentos. Desde, deberíamos seguir estacando en el interior. Le preguntamos el conse al Consejo Municipal invierta en nuestro futuro asignado el 1% de presupuesto de la ciudad de nuestro 
a los parques de la ciudad de Nueva York para que nuestros parques y áreas de juego donde juegan nuestros niños puedan estar limpios, seguros. El alcalde Adnan se comprometió con esta inversión y le pedimos que la cumpla. Nuestras familias necesitan acceso a fuentes de agua que no tenemos, no hay donde tomar agua, accesorios y baños limpios que funcionen, que no están funcionando en muchos de nuestros parques de la ciudad de Nueva York, que carecen crónicamente de fondos y de personal, no hay suficientes trabajadores de mantenimiento ni oficiales en los parques para mantener nuestros parques limpios y seguros. Le pedimos al ayuntamiento que comprometa con el 1% del presupuesto de la ciudad para los parques de la ciudad de Nueva York. Los parques son infracturados, crítica para la salud y la seguridad públicas y son motores de equidad social. Todos los neoyorquinos, incluida la gente de nuestra comunidad en Corona, merece parques, piscinas y playas centros recreativos limpios y verdes, resilientes para nuestros hijos. Gracias. Good afternoon. The following, I will paraphrase uh, what the parent had mentioned. Uh, we gather here today. We are united by a common concern that touch our families and our beloved parks. We kindly ask that our community parks um, be upkept. Um, the Current uh, parks are ridden with drug abuse and violence. Our children need to be safe. And we thank you, uh, we thank the park for allocating 1% uh, of the city budget to New York City parks so we could all be safe with everyone. Muchísimas gracias por su testimonio. Uh, me alegra mucho escuchar testimonio desde Queens sobre nuestros parques como padre también. Yo entiendo la importancia de tener parques seguros uh, y, y bellos uh, para nuestros niños, especialmente para tener un espacio afuera de la casa y para evitar la locura en la casa con los niños. Entonces, muchísimas gracias por su testimonio. Thank you so much. Uh, to conclude, now we're turning back to the administration's panel. Uh, I think we're almost at the end here. So, Councilmember Palladino, I know you had a second round question. Thank you. This is for Evelyn in my office because, <laughs> so Evelyn, if you're watching, this one's for you. Uh, she's head of constituent services. Uh, and as you know, the biggest problem we have is the removal of the trees, as I said. What she wants to know is when we have to tell our constituents that there's a two to three year delay, and when we go through the A rating, the B rating, the C, D rating. It's so difficult to explain to these constituents. Can you just help Evelyn out? Because she's probably watching. And uh, so we could give our, our constituents a tighter time frame because there's nothing worse than somebody hearing it's going to be another six years. When it's been there for six years prior, the uh, cement has been lifted, people have fallen, and uh, like I said, this one is for you, Evelyn. So help me out. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I, I understand it's very difficult to hear the stories and like to every day. try to explain limited or prioritized resources. And well, I mean, I think it makes sense just for us to have a conversation with her to sort of give her perfect. some talking points, Thank you. Uh, some things to help her out. And um, yeah. yeah, so, but I appreciate you. Well, she told me, say, hey, two out of three calls that come into this office every day is about trees. I said, okay, all right, I'll go, I'll ask. But I know the answer. You're very shorthanded. And it's just trying to translate what's going on here now with the hiring freeze and everything. I mean, how do you keep up? I mean, but it's very difficult to explain that to a homeowner or somebody who's had to pay somebody through a lawsuit because they tripped over something. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. So thank you. I know we will work together and through that partnership, we will figure out what we're going to do for District 19. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Palladino. Uh, my final question for you all on this panel on the hearing is just to close out, we spoke at the beginning, at the very beginning about the second shift program, uh, 240 workers, park staff deployed on evenings and weekends at certain hot spots around the city that is now going to be cut because of these pegs. Commissioner, can you just conclude the hearing by telling us what are the benefits of the second shift program? Why is it so important? 
Um, thank you, Council Member, for the question. And as I said earlier, um, the benefits of the second shift have been that you know um, we have park workers um, in the park in the late afternoons um, into the evenings over the weekends. Um, but as I said, what we'll be looking to do is just redeploy existing staff, pop workers, seasonal workers, to be able to cover the, that time. And I would encourage it also. Uh, and I'm sure you're doing it, but to continue having conversations with the second shift workers about their working conditions, the importance of the support they need as well. Uh, but we should be investing in this program and expanding it, uh, not cutting it, uh, unfortunately, as we're facing now. I want to thank you all so much uh, for your testimony, uh, for, for answering all our questions to and for your dedication to our parks. Uh, I hope that City Hall ultimately comes through uh, on its campaign promise of 1% of our parks. The, questions you heard today make clear how desperately that funding is needed at the very least. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Now we will open up the hearing for a public testimony. Before we begin with the testimony, I want to remind members of the public that this is a formal government proceeding and that decorum shall be observed at all times. As such, members of the public shall remain silent at all times. The witness table is reserved for people who wish to testify. No video recording or photography is allowed from the witness table. Further, members of the public may not present audio or video recordings as testimony, but may submit transcripts of such recordings to the Sergeant at Arms for inclusion in the hearing record. If you wish to speak at today's hearing, Please fill out an appearance card with the Sergeant at Arms and wait to be recognized. When recognized, you will have two minutes to speak on today's hearing topic, on our parks budget specifically. If you have a written statement or additional written testimony beyond two minutes that you wish to submit for the record, please provide a copy of that testimony to the Sergeant at Arms. You may also email written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov within 72 hours of this hearing. Audio and video recordings will not be accepted. And now I'd call up the first panel. Mm. Meredith Thompson, Maximus Alexander Barton, and Christopher uh, Loscaiso. Loscano? You may begin. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Max Barton, and I represent Labor's Local 1010 and the 2,500 plus members and retirees that our union represents in the construction industry. Uh, we are a member of the Play Fair for Parks Coalition, which includes over 400 organizations from across the five boroughs, many of whom are testifying today to advocate for the importance of our city's park system. We thank the City Council Committee on Parks Chair Krishnan for holding this important and timely hearing. And New York City parks and capital projects are important to Local 1010 because it's primarily where our members work. As a union, it is our duty to not only help our members, but to support the communities where our members work and live. Uh, as a homeowner and a father of a four-year-old in Southeast Queens, New York City parks are important to me because it's primarily where I take Adam during the spring-fall months. And it's embarrassing knowing that a fully funded, safer, cleaner park system is just a little about east in Long Island and that any money that we spend when we go out there is um, not going to our communities. Um, as a community board member on the Parks Committee, New York City parks are important to me because they're the window to our backyard. Um, anyone outside your community that visits or drives by parks and sees trash everywhere reflects wholly on the community. Uh, one does not drive by a dirty, trash-filled park and think that you're in a pleasant community. Our communities deserve a fully funded park system to carry out the basic work to do at the very least slow down the devastation currently being, play, being done to its infrastructure and green spaces by these unfair budget cuts. Play fair. 
The Parks budget has already been cut 5% for this fiscal year, as we heard earlier today. Play fair. 1,000 fewer parks workers in our communities for this fiscal year. Play fair. Parks are critical infrastructure and must be treated as such for this fiscal year and for others going forward. We say play fair a good deal and see play fair outside these halls and chambers today. Playing fair helps everyone as a group grow and thrive. Playing fair shows respect and sympathy towards everyone. And I will end early by saying playing fair is to behave honestly and honorably and to obey the rules. Thank you for your testimony. You begin. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Scalzo, and I represent Local 1010, Laborers, Employers, Cooperation, and Education Trust, also known as 1010 Lessit. 1010 Lessit brings Laborers Local 1010 and its signatory contractors together to address, to address issues of importance to both. Laborers and our employers share a lot of common ground. Working as a team, we secure projects and jobs, increase union sector market share, advertise our services, develop a workforce, and advance shared market-related interests. Local 1010 members work together to, bring, to build streets, bridges, and highways throughout the five boroughs, in addition to building parks for New York City families to enjoy. We are a proud member of the Playfair for Parks Coalition, which includes over 400 organizations from across the five boroughs, many of whom will testify today. We thank City Council Committee on Parks Chair on Parks, Chair Shakar Krishnan, for holding this hearing. New Yorkers deserve a fully funded, safe, clean, green, and resilient park system. The budget cuts to New York City parks this year and the proposed budget for next fiscal year will jeopardize the very heart of our communities. For years, Local 1010 and 1010 Lesset have witnessed New York City parks projects suffer from delays, waste, wage theft, and corruption. Proposed budget cuts to the New York City Parks Agency would be further devastating to parks infrastructure and recreational and green space for all New Yorkers. We don't need more cuts to parks. We need investment, transparency, oversight, and accountability to receive better results for New Yorkers and the workers tasked with performing parks work across the city. Beyond parks, these cuts will hinder the agency's abilities to manage its 15 miles of beaches, 51 recreation centers, 65 pools, 9,900 acre, acres of natural areas, 2,300 athletic courts, 800 ball fields, and 1,000 playgrounds. Parks are a critical infrastructure for public health and safety and are drivers for social equity. They should be funded as such. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for all the great work that Labor 1010 does. Uh, within our city and for our parks. Next up for testimony, we have Alia Sumru, Adam Ganser, and uh, Lynn Kelly. I also want to mention that we've been joined by Councilmember Linda Lee. You may start. Alia? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alia Sumro, and I'm the Deputy Director for New York City Policy at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Thank you, Chair Krishnan, and members of the Parks and Recreation Committee for the opportunity to testify. I have submitted longer written comments. As co founders of the Playfair for Parks Coalition, we stand with New Yorkers for Parks, DC 37, and over 400 coalition members to demand a city budget that gives parks the fair funding they deserve. Mayor Adams, Speaker Adams, and 43 other council members have already committed to funding 1% of the city's budget to parks, and our coalition of advocates have been strong supporters of adequately funding the maintenance, safety, and accessibility of our parks. NYLCV is also a member of the Forest for All Coalition, um, a coalition committed to protecting, maintaining, and expanding the city's urban forest uh, and equitably achieve 30% tree canopy by 2035. Despite all this support for parks, in November, Mayor Adams made a devastating announcement regarding budget cuts affecting all city agencies. Among these cuts was a $25 million reduction to the Parks Department, slashing its budget by 5%. Now, in the mayor's uh, preliminary budget, there is a proposed additional reduction of $55 million in funding for the Parks Department. 
These cuts are unacceptable, short-sighted, and they represent yet another major setback for an agency that has long suffered from disinvestment. The impacts of the pegs are profound, with one-year hiring delays evolving into program eliminations, totaling $10 million per fiscal year and the loss of about 119 positions. Uh, moreover, these budget cuts directly contradict the mayor's campaign pledge to increase parks funding and undermines the climate goals outlined in the administration's Plan NYC sustainability plan. Parks have so many benefits, and yet due to historic disinvestment and structural racism, such as residential redlining, our trees, parks, and green spaces um, are not equitably distributed. So this is also an equity issue. Parks serving primarily non-white populations are half the size of parks that serve majority white populations. So in conclusion, as members of the Playfair for Parks and Urban uh, Forest for All coalitions, um, our top line uh, priorities are ending the hiring freeze and returning to pre-COVID headcount and having the administration commit funding for a robust multi-agency planning process uh, for the urban forest plan. NYLCV stands with the Playfair for Parks and Forest for All coalitions calling for increased funding and equitable allocation for our parks, trees, and green spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alia. Lynn? Thank you, Councilor. Oops. Thank you, Council Member, and thank you for having the hearing today. My name is Lynn Kelly. I'm the Executive Director of New York Restoration Project. I'm a proud founding and member of the Playfair Coalition uh, and also a co-chair of the Parks and Open Space Partners. Um, I'm here today to make sure that the mayor keeps to his promise of the 1% of the city's budget committed to parks. For nearly 30 years, NYRP has stewarded over 80 acres of city parkland, planted well over 350 new green spaces, and uh, operate and maintain 52 community gardens. In fact, 1.6 million New Yorkers live within a 10-minute walk of a green space. But uh, sadly, I'm here again in my role um, because of the state that we're in with the city budget. New York City Parks has been operating on an austerity budget for over 40 years which I will point out is eight years longer than the tree stump that has been sitting in Councilmember Holden's district, sadly. Um, and how can we expect that an agency that stewards twice the amount of parkland than other major cities, including Chicago and Minneapolis, uh, how can we expect that they're gonna keep our parks safe and clean? In fact, Chicago and Minneapolis commit between four and 5% of their total operating budget to their parks, while we can't even imagine uh, manage 1%. Um, further disinvestment, you know, I know, we all know, leaves parks in disrepair, creating further inequalities. We can do better. We have to do better. Uh, we can't wait any longer. So I join my colleagues today to proudly say to City Hall that we need 1% of the city's budget to go towards our park system. And I sincerely hope that I am not sitting at this table next year with the same message. Um, the 40-year austerity budget and the 32-year-old tree stump in Councilmember Holden's district really makes me scratch my head. So I join you all in fighting for 1% for parks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Adam? <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair Christian, for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Adam Ganser. I'm the Executive Director of New Yorkers for Parks. We founded the Playfair Coalition with several other organizations, which now, as you've heard, includes more, for, more than 400 organizations across the city. Uh, I want to be absolutely clear and be more direct than the commissioner could, could be. Uh, New York City's park system is in crisis. The agency is approaching record lows in headcount with budget cuts in November and the proposed $55 million cut uh, that will happen in the, uh, the preliminary budget if that goes through as, as um, proposed. That's going to amount to 1,000 staffing lines. In addition to that, there are 200, I want to be clear, there are 200 existing employees on one-shot deals that will lose their positions at the end of the year. These are urban rangers, gardeners, city parks workers, folks that are in our city's parks. Uh, the commissioner could not answer what this is going to look like. I will tell you what it's going to look like. We're going to have unsafe parks. We have nearly 150 fewer PEP officers than we did just a few years ago. Dirty parks, closed bathrooms, that's going to happen. Reduced programming and rec centers, funding for which is at the lowest level it's been in 40 years. Reduced care of our city trees, as we've heard. 
Today, we and our coalition delivered 20,000 letters and petitions to the mayor and to uh, the speaker of the council, all demanding to stop these cuts and demanding 1% of the city budget. In addition, we delivered four, more than 40 letters from community boards across the city, many of those letters from the mayor's backyard. Uh, community boards, they, when we do these presentations, there's nothing more complicated and hard to do than to get a community board to agree. These meetings take five minutes. They're like, yes. Uh, to get there, we need to stop cuts to parks now. That's the first thing. Second, simply put, the parks department needs more people. Uh, we've lost 200 positions so far with the hiring freeze. That's going to go up to 600. 1,000 positions less in the preliminary budget than in previous years. Time is to make a change. Uh, New Yorkers deserve a safe, clean, and equitable park system, and I'm looking at you all to help make that change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam, and thank you to the Playfair Coalition for putting in stark terms what we all know, that our parks are indeed in crisis and that these cuts will severely impact our ability to keep our parks clean, uh, to keep many of the facilities open as long as they should be uh, in a time when we need to be investing far more in them. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll call up Morgan Monaco, Emily Walker, and Isaac Kirk Davidoff. Good afternoon, Councilmember Krishnan and the Parks Committee. I'm Morgan Monaco, president of the Prospect Park Alliance, the nonprofit that operates Prospect Park in partnership with the Parks Department. I'm here today to support the efforts of the Playfair campaign to advocate for critical funding for parks in the upcoming budget, including rolling back the 5% budget cut currently in place for NYC parks, and for the city to fulfill the mayor's campaign promise of 1% for the, of the city budget for parks. The pandemic made it resoundingly clear that parks and open spaces are essential to the well-being of our communities. Prospect Park is truly Brooklyn's backyard and welcomes more than 10 million visitors each year from every zip code in Brooklyn and beyond. In a recent community survey conducted by the Alliance, 82% of respondents cited that the park is a key reason for why they live in their neighborhood. And we are bordered by some of the most diverse neighborhoods in the city from the Little Caribbean in Flatbush to Little Bangladesh in Kensington. Our 585 acres provide fresh air and respite to Brooklyn residents, home to neighborhoods with some of the lowest amount of green space per resident. Making Prospect Park a welcoming and accessible space for diverse communities of Brooklyn is a key part of our mission. And without the support of the city and our elected officials, our work would not be possible. Since the pandemic, visitorship to the city park has increased significantly. In Prospect Park, we've seen a record number of visitors to the park throughout the year and, resulting, and the resulting impact in terms of significant wear and tear in the park. At the same time, the city has not kept up with this record use in funding of parks in the city budget. At, and Prospect Park Alliance relies on this partnership with the city, with the parks department for basic maintenance, trash management, and general upkeep of Prospect Park. Parks are essential infrastructure that are critical to our health and well-being and are drivers of social equity. The Citizens Budget Committee Commission recently released a survey on quality of life measures and noted that neighborhood parks are part of what contributes to excellent quality of life for New Yorkers. Parks have been operating with an austerity budget for more than 40 years with only 0.5% of the city budget allocated to parks, despite the fact that parks comprise 14% of city land. We applaud the city for reinstating the Parks Opportunity Program. 
um, but the f current 5% budget cuts represent a loss of 900 park staff and 55 million in critical funding, which includes, as discussed earlier, the elimination of the tremendously successful second shift program and uh, 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 further reductions in the park, urban park rangers and parks enforcement officers which is incredibly disheartening considering that currently there are only two parks enforcement officers in central Brooklyn at any one time. We implore the council to increase funding for parks in this budget cycle. In addition, we applaud the council for recognizing our parks as essential infrastructure by not only restoring current cuts, but by moving beyond cycle to cycle funding model. 1% of our budget must be for parks. Parks saved us during the pandemic. It's time to make sure they get their fair share of the budget. Thank Thanks you. so much, Morgan. Emily. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Walker and I'm the Senior Manager of External Affairs at the Natural Areas Conservancy. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, Chair Krishnan. Our written testimony includes our FY25 budget asks to support natural areas, but I'm actually going to go off script today with the blessing of our Executive Director. Last Earth Day, the NAC was asked to stand beside Mayor Adams in Alley Pond Park as he made an announcement of a historic $2.4 million investment in our citywide 300-mile network of nature trails. Seeing our executive director, Sarah, standing beside the mayor, Commissioner Donahue, and the head of MOCEJ was a proud moment for our entire team. It was even more exciting to see the mayor help complete a wooden punch and trail structure with my colleague, Gabe. My colleague, Giselle, was thrilled to know that a new pipeline of 26 permanent jobs at NYC Parks had been created, jobs that were perfectly suited to our network of talented CUNY interns who she helps mentor and manage each year. Last fall, however, our hopes for this funding were erased with the mayor's announcement that 5% of the FY24 parks budget was being cut. Former interns who were in the process of interviewing for trails positions were suddenly told that the program wasn't moving forward, dashing their hopes of full-time work in our natural areas. It was devastating for our entire team and frankly left us feeling like props used to burnish the sustainability bona fides of the mayor without an actual commitment to do the work. For less than the cost of a new park bathroom, the city could have created dozens of green jobs, opened up safe access to 10,000 acres of parkland, and taken meaningful action to protect our urban forested natural areas. Instead, as is so often the case with the parks budget, the city walked back on its promise. We believe the answer is simple. Fund people, create jobs, fund forestry, fund trails, fund rangers, fund maintenance and operations, fund green thumb, fund pep, just fund parks. I'm in awe of the hundreds of park advocates who have been doing this work for years. They've never given up on pushing the city to do right by everyday New Yorkers by better funding its parks. Right now, City Hall has the opportunity to reverse these harmful cuts and finally acknowledge what advocates have been saying for decades, that every single New Yorker deserves access to clean, safe, beautiful, and resilient parks. With your leadership, this can be the year that the city finally plays fair for parks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you for your powerful testimony and moving words. Next, we have uh, Heather Lubov, Sala Balistreri, and Christina Taylor. Good afternoon, Chair Krishnan. I'm Heather Lubov, Executive Director of City Parks Foundation, a citywide nonprofit that supports a vibrant, thriving park system by offering free environmental, performing arts, sports, and community building programs. We manage the New York City Green Fund, which raises private support that is distributed through grants to our city's most under-resourced parks and open spaces. We co-manage Partnership for Parks, a joint program of City Parks Foundation and NYC Parks, that supports 28,000 volunteers and almost 500 community park groups each year by offering critical outreach training and technical assistance. And we also staff and support the New York City Parks and Open Space Partners Coalition of more than 50 nonprofit stewards and conservancies. We raise millions of dollars in private support to do our work, but we also rely on the City Council's Visionary Parks Equity Initiative, as do so many parks organizations. Despite years of insufficient public funding, New Yorkers' support and appreciation for parks is incredibly high. And yet, just as the Parks Department has launched Let's Green NYC to encourage more volunteerism in parks, the agency's staffing and resources are being cut. 
The 5% reduction that was enacted last fall, layered upon decades of systemic de defunding of parks, is deeply destabilizing for the Parks Department, for nonprofit partners, and the countless New Yorkers who use their parks. Aside from the significant challenges that short staffing poses to parks operations and maintenance generally, our own Partnerships for Parks team has already lost two administration-funded community engagement coordinator positions out of a team of 15, with two more to be cut, making it difficult for us to reach out to and support the many volunteers who work in parks, leading to a cycle of staff burnout and more departures. On the City Parks Foundation side, we rely on a combination of private and initiative support to provide the intensive outreach and technical assistance that volunteers need to be sustainable in the long term. From training, coaching, fiscal sponsorship and micro grants to coordinators who organize service projects for volunteer park stewards. We are seeking not only the renewal of, but an increase to the Parks Equity Initiative to accommodate for this ever expanding work. We're doing everything we can to generate new private support and to use the New York City Green Fund to help identify alternative revenue streams that can complement city funding and stabilize our parks. But these, the administration is not off the hook. We are a member of the Playfair Coalition and call for an end to the hiring freeze, adding back the parks workers and reinstating crucial programs. We urge the city to step up and invest in a fair budget by restoring the budget cuts and providing 1% of the city budget to support parks. Thank you, Heather. Sarah? Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Ballas Jerry, and I am an environmental educator with Trees New York, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to plant, preserve, and protect New York City's trees. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Chair Krishnan, to provide testimony about the importance of funding parks and the essen essential maintenance they perform of our urban forest. Trees New York engages community volunteers, students, block associations, garden groups, businesses, and corporate volunteers in activities that promote the health of, the, of urban trees, like pruning and tree bed care. Incidentally, Trees New York was formed in the 1970s by neighbors who observed gaps in the ongoing maintenance of their street trees, even when, as committee chair Krishnan shared, parks at the time received 1.2% of the city's overall budget. We are proud of the work that our volunteer stewards and citizen pruners take on to maintain our city's trees, but they're there to augment, not replace, the central role that the city plays in tree and park maintenance. Parks and street trees are not a luxury. They are part of our city's essential infrastructure and provide countless environmental and social benefits, and as such, they deserve adequate funding. There has been promising energy and commitment toward increasing New York City's canopy cover to 30%. Many immediately think that this means plant more trees, but the data shows that the biggest contributor to canopy expansion is actually the growth and maturing of existing trees. As I have testified before, we often say that it actually takes five years to plant a tree, about an hour to put it in the ground, and then the remaining time to ensure that it becomes properly established. Trees that survive these first crucial years in the ground are much more likely to grow to maturity and provide the maximum benefits of canopy cover, heat reduction, carbon sequestration, and stormwater interception, things that ultimately save New Yorkers money. This is why funding the maintenance of the urban forest makes sense. Caring for the trees we have now and promoting their long-term health will pay off in the long run. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much, Sarah. Christina? Good afternoon. I'm Christina Taylor, Deputy Director of the Van Cortlandt Park Alliance. Can you turn your mic on, please? Oh. Sorry, I didn't realize really got turned off. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. I'm Christina Taylor, Deputy Director of the Van Cortlandt Park Alliance. We are proud members of the Playfair for Parks Coalition, um, and we thank you for holding this hearing today. New Yorkers deserve a fully funded, safe, clean, green, and resilient park system. The budget cuts to New York City parks this year and the proposed cuts for next year jeopardize the very heart of our communities. These cuts will make it even more difficult for the already understaffed, under-resourced Parks Department to carry out the basic work needed to ensure parks are equitable and accessible for all New Yorkers. As you know, the Parks budget was recently cut by $25 million, and now we're looking at another $55 million cut. Year after year, New York, New York City Parks staff does more with less. The staff is already stretched too thin, they are tired and frustrated, and so are we. 
The hiring freeze and reduced budget will result in nearly 1,000 park workers. How are park staff supposed to keep all of our parks clean with Please just stop. <laughs> with no second shift? Second shift means that yesterday's mess gets cleaned up before today's visitors arrive. Without it, staff will never get on top of the garbage and parks will look awful. Parks enforcement patrols are, numbers are already at their lowest. They have been in several years. The work of PEP is to ensure public safety and quality of life for all New Yorkers. Without them, mopeds and scooters will run amok in our parks. Since the mayor is so concerned about trash and safety, he ought to fund parks to make sure they are clean and safe. To be sure, with these budget cuts, it is New Yorkers who will suffer. Without enough staff, playgrounds will not open on time, if at all. Bathrooms will not be clean and will not stay open late on summer nights. Sports fields will not be groomed. Graffiti will not be removed. Garbage will not be picked up. PEP will be practically non-existent. Pools will not be fully staffed, so you can forget about any special programs like learn to swim and late hours on the hottest days of the year. It's not a pretty picture. We demand 1% of the city's uh, budget for NYC parks. Mayor Adams repeatedly committed to this, and he needs to follow through. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, our next panel is Rosa Chang, Julieta Fiore, uh, and Scott Daly. Good afternoon, Chair Krishnan, members of the committee. My name is Scott Daly, and I'm the Senior Director of the New York Junior Tennis and Learning, better known throughout the city as NYJTL. We provide free tennis for all kids, 5 to 18 years of age, in all five boroughs, 12 months a year. We are not a one-and-done organization. We don't go in one day and then come out. We provide extended programs, six to eight weeks, throughout the city, 12 months a year. We hit over 90,000 kids. Let me repeat that, over 90,000 kids are reached only because of the funding that we get from the New York City Council. We, have the, we are funded under the Physical Education and Fitness Initiative and through various uh, sources from the council members. You know, nobody can deny the benefits of physical fitness on these kids. We allow the kids to be kids. They go out and play. We're not putting a book in front of them. We get to them. We reach them in all the five boroughs. Um, a lot of the high school seniors that we have, they come and they start working for us after they come up through the program. We have our own kind of SYEP. You know, um, let me just talk about the money aspect for a minute. We get a million eight hundred thousand dollars from the city council. Now we've been at that number for eight hundred for sixteen years since we were cut back back in 20, 2008. Since that time, nobody can deny how much prices have gone up. Wages, minimum wages, more than double. Permit fees have tripled. Our equipment costs are up. Buses, transportation. We can't do it. We don't get a cola increase, by the way. There's no cola for anybody who works with when we're funded in this fashion through the council's discretionary money. We could use the extra money. With the extra money, if we fund us for the million dollars, we'll be able to provide extra hours, extra sites, more Saturday programs. All this translates into more kids being hit, being able to participate, kids who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your continued support. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, hello there. My name is Julieta Fiore, and I am testifying on behalf of the Historic House Trust of New York City. First, I want to thank Chair Krishnan for holding this hearing and for advocating for our critical parks infrastructure. As a member of the Playfair Coalition, the Historic House Trust calls upon the city to invest in our parks and their diverse resources by dedicating 1% of the budget to New York City parks. As some of the oldest structures in New York, the 23 city-owned sites that we help steward sit on over 400 acres of land that have remained green space for hundreds of years. 
Thanks to the partnership of over 20 community-based nonprofits that operate the sites as museums, these historic places tie the history of New York City to our present day lives and provide opportunities for residents to be outside, to learn, and to engage with their neighbors. Located in areas that are often underserved by larger cultural institutions, our partner sites serve many communities that are historically underrepresented. Head to the Valentine Varian House to learn about one of the earliest interracial housing complexes in the Bronx, the Allerton Coops, or experience LGBTQ plus history firsthand through exhibitions and photography workshops at the Alice Austin House on Staten Island. Experience the annual Thunderbird American Indian Pow Wow with the Queens County Farm Museum, or purchase vegetables farmed in Brooklyn through the Wyckoff House Museum's Youth Garden Apprentice Program. The budget cuts to New York City parks jeopardize the very heart of these communities. These cuts will make it even more difficult for the already understaffed, under-resourced Parks Department to carry out the basic work needed to ensure parks are equitable and accessible for all New Yorkers especially in communities that are unable to supplement New York City Park services with private funding, these public spaces have begun to suffer. Despite the best efforts of hardworking New York City Park's employees who are constantly being asked to do more with less, years of disinvestment in New York City Parks have taken a toll on these public resources. In addition to trash buildup and overgrown lawns, we're seeing unsafe conditions on pathways, deteriorating roofs and wood siding, water infiltration, and even hate speech graffiti. Without funding for maintenance workers, specialized tradespeople like carpenters, and general investment across all five boroughs, we fear that communities will no longer see these parks' resources as safe and welcoming places. By allocating more funds to New York City parks in the FY25 budget, you will be supporting livable communities citywide and empowering millions of New Yorkers in their own communities. On behalf of our partners and neighbors, thank you for this opportunity to voice our needs. Thank you. Hi, Chair Krishnan. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, How are you? <laughs> very good. Um, hi, uh, my name is Rosa Chang. I'm the co-founder of Gotham Park, a grassroots community-led nonprofit that successfully advocated for the opening of new public space beneath the Brooklyn Bridge a block away from here. In two short years, our advocacy opened our first of an eventual nine-acre plan. And in our third year, we will have opened three acres, and we are hurtling toward our goal to deliver open space in a neighborhood that has been historically disadvantaged and has been underinvested in for generations. Because we are located beneath the landmark Brooklyn Bridge and its associated steel spaghetti of on and off ramps, we are a DOT plaza and not a park. So why am I here today? Uh, Gotham Park is a proud member of the Playfair Coalition because no matter the legal definition, we are park to any New Yorker who comes to visit the space. And we are here to advocate for all the green spaces in our beloved city. What I call the sanity spaces that are essential to the health and wellness of our residents and, to this, and are the space where community gets built and comes together. Because cities are built by people for people. And if they do not benefit the people who live here, then they fail. And that's, it's literally that simple. In a city where the vast majority of us live in tiny apartments, have zero access to outdoor space, and live on top of each other, and my own building actually has 408 apartments, so I do mean that literally, um, we need to invest in the parks and open spaces that are our shared backyards. Within a city as dense as ours, parks are as, are as essential a component of urban infrastructure as our sewers, our lights, and our streets. And like these fundamental components of civic infrastructure, public dollars must go into their maintenance. We would not accept if 50% of our streets, street lights, and our sewers did not work. 1% of our city's budget is the floor and not the ceiling of what we need. Without care and maintenance, our parks are dangerous and unusable. This past weekend in Gotham Park, our team of volunteers picked up and bagged 420 pounds of trash. That's what was in one acre in one week. If that's what we can pick up from one week of use, imagine the need for maintenance across our parks throughout the city. It's beyond time we put our money where our values are, and that should be in our people and in our parks. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and all your great work across your organizations. Our next panel is Joe Puglio, Marlena Giga, and uh, John Serco.
Hey, good afternoon, Chair. My name is Joe Puglio. For those of you who don't know me, I am the president of Local 983. I represent the urban park rangers, the pep officers, the associate park service workers, and all the city seasonal aides. Uh, this year, again, we hear uh, it's known as the dance, I believe they call it, right, where we, our funding gets cut. But what makes this year different is we started off uh, at the best of times when we were supposed to get 1%. So not only did we not get the 1%, we got probably the most severe cuts right, uh, in recent years. So it's really a detriment to the people who use our New York City parks. Our parks are going to be dirty, they're going to be filthy. The parks aren't going to be safe. There's not going to be enough people there to patrol and make sure that uh, undesirable things do not happen. Um, I'm asking right, that we have all of this funding restored. And, uh, in addition to this, we would like to see the 1% that was promised to us. Okay, and also on behalf of uh, Ms. Delcy Benz, who could not be here today, she has said that uh, her city park workers are, are facing safety concerns closing parks. Uh, in recent times, uh, she stated to me that these parks are becoming more difficult uh, to have people exit the parks at closing time. People are not uh, being, when they're instructed to leave, are not leaving and is, and is posing a, a serious danger to, to her members. Uh, again, I, I praise you for your work. I know you've been a strong uh, advocate, and we thank you, but we, we cannot sit here and, and uh, take this while, while um, we're being deprioritized, de I think is a, is, is a good definition here. Because money is out there, money is being spent, but we feel like it's not being spent where it should be spent. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Please thank Dilsey as well for her hard work every day. Marlena? Hi, my name is Marlena Giga, and I am a New York City Park Enforcement Officer slash also Ranger. Um, we're responsible for patrolling all of New York City parklands, uh, natural forests, the beaches, and all of the city pools. And I can tell you that uh, the, the staff has been dwindling. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to keep the, the parks and the pools and the beaches safe. Uh, we really need the funding to keep New York City going. Um, we're encountering a lot more homeless individuals living inside of uh, parks, and one of the things that we do is we uh, assist getting the help that the homelessness needs into uh, shelters and SRO. We're finding people in the woods, really in the middle of nowhere. Um, and we just, we need the funding for the security. Uh, the PEP officers and the rangers are designated at protecting all parkland, not NYPD. So we really need the public and for everybody to understand that. The park rangers are also responsible for doing all kinds of nature walks and tours uh, for New York City children. And it's so important because a lot of the interactions that uh, children have sometimes with a horse or uh, the, the New York City native wildlife is with the park ranger. And we don't want those programs to be cut we also need the funding to keep the, the parks clean. So please, we have to invest in um, all these titles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marlena. Oh, there we go. Good afternoon. I'm John Sirico, the Senior Fellow for Climate and Opportunity at the Center for Durham Future, an independent think tank to provide sufficient funding to pay for them. We strongly support the City Council's effort to reverse the nearly $54 million in cuts proposed for FY 2025. But without deeper changes, it's unlikely that this budget process will meet New York's ever-growing parks and open space needs in the near future. That's why city leaders need to get creative and seek out new sustainable sources of revenue for parks. Our newest report at Center for the Future outlines 20 specific and achievable ideas to do exactly that. 
A new dollar surcharge on tickets sold at stadiums located on parkland like City Field and Arthur Ashe Stadium could help offset a significant share of the park system's maintenance needs. At City Field alone, this surcharge, this surcharge would generate more than $2.5 million for parks, enough to hire more than 50 full-time gardeners. A modest expansion of restaurants, cafes, and other concessions in parks could generate new funding for parks while enhancing the experience of park goers. City officials could also consider enacting fees on gas-powered landscaping and stormwater management, as well as soliciting a voluntary contribution from hotel guests. For-profit events held in parks, from so soccer camps to music festivals, should be asked to contribute marked more to parks' bottom line. And by investing in the infrastructure needed to monetize organic waste from parks, the city can convert a, a multi-million dollar annual expense into a steady stream of revenue. Similarly, the city should enable more New Yorkers to directly support their green spaces. For example, a membership program with corporate tiers, ticketed special events, and well-designed merchandise could tap New Yorkers' pride and generosity to benefit parks. And New York City should make it much easier for nonprofit organizations and community groups to step in and support their local park groups, a process too often bogged down in bureaucracy. The center commends the city council for consistently championing parks and open spaces. Thanks also to Chair Krishnan for his thoughtful consideration of the ideas in our recent report. By getting creative about generating dedicated new revenues for parks, city leaders can deliver the healthy, vibrant parks and open spaces that New Yorkers need now and for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you everyone for hearing us today. Chair Christian, thank you for all the work you continue to do. My name is Ralph Basilis. I am also a park enforcement sergeant slash urban park ranger. And as my coworker explained, not only do we make sure the park patrons are safe and protected when they're enjoying their time in free recreational space. We also provide emergency service. The urban park rangers do free pop-up educational courses for the children of the city of New York. Now, not too many things are free. These are free classes for children all throughout the five boroughs. In addition to those two titles, Local 983 also represents the APSW's associate park service workers. I heard someone behind me mention 420 pounds of garbage. That's nothing. Our APSWs are required to maintain a CDL driver's license throughout their employment to operate all of the heavy duty equipment that is used to keep not only the parks clean, the beaches clean, the beach rakes, and right now we're having major issues because parks cannot maintain the big packers the 30-yard roll-off containers, which transport this garbage once it leaves the receptacle you throw it in to the New York City dumps. We need the 1%, we need more than 1%, but all the titles we represent play a major role in making sure these free recreational spaces in New York City operate daily. I mean, I go back to the pandemic. How many christenings, graduation parties, people weren't working, they had no money. This is where they went. The parks was at maximum usage People in New York City, rent is expensive. You need a place to go for free. Rec centers, we operate all these things. So even though it's a small part of the budget, it is a main, main opponent. Right, yes, thank you, Joe. And uh, that's it. I just wanted you guys to be aware of all the stuff our members actually do in the park, in addition to Ms. Dilsey Ben's members. You know, clean, sanitary, these are big, big, especially after COVID. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you so much, Ralph, for your work, for your members' work, too. Appreciate all DC 37 does, and for all of you really making clear in stark personal terms the work that you all do every single day in our parks. We wouldn't have the park system we do without you all, and it's the responsibility of our city, of City Hall, to be supporting each and every one of you. Thank you for your work. Thank you, John, for your testimony. Next, we'll call up uh, Merritt Birnbaum, Joby, Joby Jacob and Kathleen uh, Corm Corman. Carmen? Thank you. No, it's okay. Merit. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Merit Birnbaum. I'm the president and CEO of Riverside Park Conservancy. We are also one of the over 400 organizations who are members of the Playfair Coalition. 
and, and thank you, Parks Committee Chair Krishnan, for calling this hearing and for your tireless advocacy on behalf of our city's parks, which are in crisis. Riverside Park Conservancy works through an agreement with NYC Parks to help the city care for 450 acres that spread across five parks along six miles of the waterfront in Upper Manhattan from West 59th Street to 181st Street. We're fortunate to have built a 35-year history that leverages thousands of volunteer hours as well as significant funding to supplement the city's dwindling workforce. We recognize that the vast majority of the parks in our city do not have the benefit of conservancy groups, so our situation really only underscores how dire the current crisis is for the parks in our most vulnerable communities. And make no mistake, the crisis is real. We see it every day in Riverside, Fort Washington, West Harlem Piers, and Socorro Parks as we struggle to keep them clean, safe, and green. I wanna say that in June 2008, uh, between the full-time and seasonal CPWs in our park, we had approximately 79. This June, we'll be lucky if we have 20 of them. CPWs, as was discussed before, do everything from picking up trash to cleaning bathrooms to removing graffiti. They are the front line of the Parks Department, and in our park alone, their ranks have fallen to 25% of what they were 16 years ago. In smaller parks around the city, we're not talking about one parks worker at this point, we're talking about a fraction of a parks worker. How can we accept this? Parks are critical infrastructure and they need to be funded the same way that we fund roads and bridges and hospitals and police and sanitation. Um, I wanna call attention to one thing. In the last five decades, the city has proudly claimed claim to have created 200 new parks. And in 1970, as was pointed out, the Parks Department headcount was 11,000. So how do we get to 7,000 parks workers for 200 more parks? It's a simple math question. How can our government say it prioritized sanitation and safety and not consider the public parks that occupy 14% of our city surface area? Just this past Sunday in our park, NYC park staff were slated for spring landscape work and they were pulled away to paint over an incidence of major graffiti in a high traffic location. They dropped what they were doing and they pivoted because that is what CPWs do. They respond to the needs on the ground and they get the work done. If we want bathrooms open and clean, we need staff. If we want lawns that are green and not filled with rotting trash, we need staff. If we want stairs and pathways that are clear of safety hazards, we need staff. If we want healthy trees and plants, we need staff. We demand that the city fulfill its promise and deliver 1% of our budget for parks. This is a rounding error for City Hall, and it is a lifeline for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Merritt. Couldn't agree more. My name is Joby Jacob. I'm a professor at LaGuardia Community College, and I'm here uh, in my capacity as a lifelong Queens resident and co-founder of the Eastern Queens Greenway. We started Eastern Queens Greenway almost 10 years ago to advocate for filling in the gaps in the trails that connect Alley Pond Park to Cunningham Park to Casina Park to Flushing Meadows Corona Park. In the 50s, in the 70s, and in the 80s, plans were put forward to link these parks with a 13-mile trail, but the funding never materialized. The Destination Greenways program gave us a new plan, and thanks to this mayor and to this council, a good portion of the plan was funded. Uh, but there are two critical gaps that correspond to Destination Greenways projects uh, four and eight between um, Utopia Parkway and the Vanderbilt Motor Parkway and between Main Street and College Point Boulevard. So imagine this, sometime in the future, this world-class greenway is built, kids and families from all over the city come to enjoy this 13-mile trail, which is completely off the streets and in our parks. But on the 13-mile stretch, there are two half-mile gaps. One gap would have children navigating a five-way, all-way stop on wide streets, and the other would have them riding their bikes for Queens residents, you'll know this street, Booth Memorial Avenue, where former Assemblywoman Young was struck and seriously injured while riding her bike in 2008. We would never tell children to ride on this stretch, 
but that's in fact what we will be doing if we don't build these remaining portions of the Greenway. So I'd ask you to consider funding uh, to fill in these two gaps in the trail. Again, one between Main Street and College Point Boulevard and the other between Utopia Parkway and the Vanderbilt Motor Parkway. And of course, um, we do support um, the Playfair, uh, the Playfair 1% for parks. 1% should be the minimum. Thank you. Thank you, Shaker. Thank you so much, Joey. Hello, I'm Kathleen Corrigan. I'm a retired pediatrician from the East Village, and I'm here today on behalf of our all-volunteer group Friends of Tompkins Square Park. We're testifying that New York City parks deserve 1% of the budget. We're members of the Playfair for Parks Coalition, and we thank you today for hosting this hearing. Tompkins Square Park, with its 10 and a half acres, has no bathrooms. We have, we have no gardener, and our small maintenance crew of six people clean the park. Currently, the park staff is responding to the unexpected challenges as asylum seekers take respite in the southeast quadrant of the park while they await entry to the St. Bridget's Church Reticketing Center. And as our local mutual aid groups welcome and provide meals to the asylum seekers, our park staff has increased trash collection and general maintenance. Since January, we have witnessed their compassion, their empathy, and their willingness to welcome the asylum seekers and accept the extra work that's needed to carry out their basic duties. You may be aware of the shooting in the park last Saturday as we hosted 13 volunteers assisting the park staff in cleanup. And again, we witnessed the park staff, their dedication and their resiliency as they responded with grace under pressure to this tragic event. Over the past year, our group has swept under benches, collected trash, we've weeded, amended the soil, planted, watered hundreds of new plants, and we've learned firsthand the tremendous amount of physical labor that's done by our park staff. And our park staff is critical to a thriving park and a thriving community. And lastly, Tompkins Square Park has no bathroom. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for those important points. Thank you. Uh, Mary, just one question. I just want to clarify. You had said there are 200 more parks now since the 1970s while the budget and workforce has gone down from that point? Yeah, I decided to look that up today. So that's very accurate uh, according to the park's website. They estimate that they've built about 200 parks in the last two years. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next panel is uh, Leona Chin. And uh, Iceland Klein. Leona, you may begin. Sure, another one. Okay. Um, my name is Leona Chin, and I represent Casina Synergy, a proactive, inclusive, diverse, multi generational, multilingual, multi abled volunteer team, and an on the ground, public facing New York City Parks Friends Group serving out of Casina Park in Flushing, New York. We are here to support and ask that the 1% funding pledge to the Parks Department be fulfilled. Our volunteer teams serve five mornings a week and are powered and informed by the New York City Parks Department, Natural Areas Conservancy, and the New York Restoration Project. Our efforts are directed and coordinated by a collaboration of these three organizations. 
we are two years into a collaborative reforestation project as well as a destination greenways project based and running through Casino Park, respectively. Our volunteers mobilize each week to clean, plant, mulch, and weed, and to care for and sustain the forest and trails in our park. Our volunteer leads are trained forestry and trail maintenance stewards. Our overworked gardeners, staff, and parks manager oversee and support our focused efforts. Just yesterday, at the request of community members, our teams painted lines on a basketball court, which was last refreshed seven years ago. Our volunteer teams are young and old, students and professionals, working and retired, as well as pre-vocational individuals learning and gaining transferable and productive skills and skill sets. Our volunteers are both servants and patrons of our parks, which have provided respite and safe, healthy opportunities to walk, jog, bike, dance, and recreate alone or together with community. Each July, our teams brace themselves for the inevitable announcement that our project staff and leads will not be returning. As volunteers, we cannot emphasize enough the collective talent and wisdom that is embodied by these managers and staff that have survived many years of budget cuts. Together, we have adapted and pivoted together to stay on our service timelines to maintain, preserve, nurture, and assist in the forestry projects and trail maintenance assignments so sorely needed for safe and clean green spaces for our communities. Our communities cannot afford to lose any more park staff or their knowledge bases. Park staffs are our day-to-day -day frontline personnel that continue to serve our communities while lacking basic supplies and resources. We see it every day. Lastly, I invite you all to visit us at Casino Park in person or virtually to see our collaborative progress despite past budget cuts. Please support and reinstate 1% of fiscal year 25 budget funding for parks. Thank you all for your kind consideration of my testimony, Committee Chair Krishnan and members of the Parks Committee. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> Thank you, Council Member, for this opportunity to testify. My name is Aislinn Klein. I'm with the Municipal Arts Society of New York, MAS. MAS is a member of the Playfair for Parks Coalition and the NYC Force for All Coalition. And we support our partners in their demands to allocate 1% of the city budget to the Department of Parks and Recreation, NYC Parks, and to fund our urban forest. For the past 130 years, MAS has advocated on behalf of the city's public realm, including an equitable and resilient system of parks and open spaces, and adequate funding to ensure that these public assets thrive. The importance of our city's parks and urban green spaces cannot be overstated as they are essential to our well-being and health and our critical infrastructure in the fight to address climate change and support our long-term sustainability goals. In addition to providing maintenance to 30,000 acres of public parkland, NYC Parks also operates community and recreation centers that are part of the city's lifeblood and administer crucial public programs to New Yorkers of all ages. Further, NYC Parks maintains the city's urban forest which helps improve public and environmental health by mitigating the heat island effect, lowering emissions, and supporting biodiversity. Thus, it is vital that NYC Parks is sufficiently funded to serve New Yorkers across all five boroughs, across all seasons, and for years to come. The continued underfunding of NYC Parks has contributed to growing inequity across our communities. Parks are the backyards for millions of New Yorkers, but to be usable, they need to be maintained. The city budget must allocate 1% to NYC parks and retain pre-pandemic staffing levels to effectively uphold these vital public resources. Further, meeting force for all's demands for the city to fulfill its commitment to a 30% tree canopy coverage by 2035 necessitates investment now to return greater cost savings in the future. While Mayor Adams pledged 1% for NYC parks in his initial campaign, the Adams administration has reversed this assurance. NYC Parks faces devastating budget cuts with even less funding than in fiscal year 2024. These cuts will widen system, systemic inequities, diminish public health, eliminate park programs, limit accessibility, and add to the already present overburden on NYC Parks staff and resources. 
MAS stands by Playfair and Forest for All in calling on the Adams administration to reevaluate these detrimental cuts and renew its commitment to NYC parks, issuing the 1% funding commitment, increasing parks staff headcount to pre-pandemic levels, baselining 300 agency positions, and creating an urban forest plan to ensure our public spaces are clean, green, resilient, and so that NYC parks can maintain our city's critical public realm for generations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks uh, Council Member Krishnan for having us today. Um, now I've been to many parks in all five boroughs. I seek these places out. I have taken buses, boats, and trains to visit these places. I have traveled from where the fair four train starts to where it ends, just to visit a park. I started a YouTube channel focused on them. I have since spoken to many people, including some council members. I've been spending a lot of time at Crispus Attucks Playground in Brooklyn. Crispus Attucks was the first person killed in the Revolutionary War. A freed slave, he became a martyr and American hero. The park that bears his name was the first park named after an African-American figure in New York City. 20 years ago, this playground <coughs> was called by another name, Prostitution Park. Since that time, a new, play, a new playground with new playground equipment was built. The basketball court was renamed for Biggie Smalls, who grew up nearby. It now attracts people of all ages throughout the community. I see glimpses of this playground's past reputation, though. Councilmember Robert Holden talks about a return to the battle days of New York City. I'm from California, so my New York City experience is formed by TV and movies. What I witnessed at the bathroom at Chris's Attics was a, as graphic as any scene from a gritty 70s movie. The bathroom is often a drug den, and the aesthetic is there. The flickering lights, the deep shadows, the dirt. Many of the bathrooms are like this, and you know it. This park is often filled with trash and has many dead trees that have never been replaced. It is a sizable community center that is only used for one class. All of this makes me sad. Parks need a larger investment and a, reinvest and a reassessment on how that investment is spent. We need parks to keep us, we need parkies to keep these places clean, to make us feel safe, to make us feel connected. Without safe, clean parks, New York City would be a pretty shitty place to live. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next we have up uh, Sally Burns, Raphael Schweitzer, and uh, Savona McLean. <laughs> Thank you, committee. My name is Sally Burns, and I'm the planning associate at Union Square Partnership. We're the nonprofit business improvement district working to create a safe, clean, and vibrant neighborhood for Union Square's residents, businesses, and visitors. Union Square Park is a critical open space and an important civic gathering place for the entire city. It's not only a green oasis in a bustling mixed use district, but a site for free expression and the chosen venue for hundreds of demonstrations, performances, and public events each year, including the city's flagship green market operating four days a week. Due to this intensive use, the infrastructure beneath our beautiful park is aging and failing, which has resulted in deteriorating plumbing and drainage systems that have caused sinkholes and eroding pathways. With failing irrigation, the park plantings rely on makeshift and expensive workarounds that have caused the landscaping to decline. The current conditions are not only a detriment to plant and tree health, but create unsafe conditions for pedestrians. The park is located above the fourth busiest subway station in New York City, 
And rather than waiting for a disaster when water pipes break, we're calling for our city leaders to be proactive and fund these repairs before it's too late. We're here today to advocate for funding to repair Union Square Park's plumbing, drainage systems, and pathway reconstruction, the full 8.9 million estimated by the Parks Department. We would like to thank Manhattan Community Board 5 for their letter of support and Council Members Rivera, Botchers, Powers, Chair Krishnan, and Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine's staff for taking the time to meet about this important project. Our parks are essential public spaces for our city's health and sustainability. So we urge the council and the city to ensure a fully funded, safe, clean, green, and resilient park system. We look forward to the council's support and working with Commissioner Donahue on this effort. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Savannah McLean. Good afternoon. My name is Savannah Bailey McLean. I'm the executive director of the West Harlem Art Fund. We're a small public art and new media organization. Now you might wonder why we're here talking about parks. Well, landscaping, parks, trees goes hand in hand with public art. You can't have one without the other. I have a written testimony that I shared regarding soil because there is a severe soil erosion and compaction problem in West Harlem. That's in St. Nicholas and Jackie Robinson Park. But after hearing the testimonies I've heard today, I'm going to speak freely. One, we're not gonna get the 1% from Mayor Adams. Let's just forget about that. We need city council to really work hand in hand with the public to come up with innovation, innovative uh, uh, projects and solutions for our parks. We can't rely on just increased money for the Parks Department, it's just not going to happen. The second thing is the Parks Department needs to kind of change the way they operate as well. We have been complaining for years, at least I have, about the way they do not include people of color. How do they, how they do not listen to our solutions, our ways of dealing with um, the problems that they're facing today. Instead of just talking about trash and homeless people, why don't we inspire New Yorkers? Why don't we ask them to help? Not so much to clean today, to really rethink how we approach parks, so therefore we still advocate for the 1%, but we look for other ways, monies, means to take care of our parks. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, uh, and I couldn't agree more about the connection between public art and public space and parks. Thank you. Now we have, we're going to, that concludes our in-person testimony. Uh, we do have some uh, virtual, test, virtual witnesses as well. Uh, Isaac Davidoff, followed by Elise Hirschlag. Hi, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I'm speaking today as a parks worker, New Yorker, union member, lifelong parks user. Uh, I urge the council to restore baseline permanent funding for the 51 forest restoration workers and baseline permanent funding for a citywide transportation program. My lower back can testify that this is hard technical skilled work. Can't rely on just volunteer and seasonal labor. Not renewing these lines will mean scores of acres of forest, dozens of miles of trails will go without maintenance and care for one, maybe more years, probably more years. Already there's so much more to do than what we have the staff for. Uh, these 51 people are so-called full-time seasonals. So we don't, I don't know until like June 25th if I'm gonna have a job the next week. That's nuts. Picture the weight it puts on you to not know until the end of June if you have a job in July. Picture the uncertainty, the stress, the competition for the one or two permanent positions that open up. There's a banner hanging in the forest restoration trailer that everyone signs when they leave. After a few months, it's already filled up with signatures. Last year, the mayor made a promise to finally fund a citywide trails program, just like his promise to fund 1% for parks. We did a whole photo op about it. Uh, but just as work plans were being made and resumes were being sent in, the funding was paused and then canceled. Trails are how working class people can connect to wildness for free right in the middle of the city. And good trail work lasts for decades, and I do very good trail work. It's strong, resilient, and it's made out of rock and timber, but right now the city is giving us a foundation made out of sand. 
Thank you for your testimony. Next, Elise Hirschlag, followed by Lonnie Portis. You may begin. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Elise Hirschlag. I'm a member of City Council District 22 in Astoria, Queens, um, and I'm also speaking as a parks worker. Um, thank you to the council who serve on this committee and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, my neighborhood park is Astoria Park, but I've spent a lot of time um, in this position in forests all over the city like Idlewild, Alley Pond, and Cunningham Park, and I've grown to love our city's natural areas and have become heavily invested in their future. I'm here today to ask the council to restore the 2.5 million in funding for fiscal year 25 for the 51 forestry management staff whose jobs are set to expire in June. Um, plan YC, the 10-year citywide sustainability plan set by the Adams administration, includes initiatives to quote, achieve 30% canopy cover, improve the health of our forested areas, and grow NYC's green workforce, end quote. Forestry management staff are a critical part to achieving these goals. They plant thousands of trees, slow the damage of invasive species, care for street trees, steward our urban forest with volunteers, and provide 51 green job opportunities. So cutting these positions is completely antithetical to the Plan YC initiatives. We can't say as a city that we prioritize forests and then cut all the jobs that take care of them. Um, it's a disservice to the staff. It's a disservice to citizens like myself as well, who I want cleaner, fresher air to breathe and the forests that provide them. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Lonnie Portis, followed by Diana Finch. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Chair Krishnan and the Committee on Parks and Recreation. I'm Lonnie Portis, New York City, a Policy and Advocacy Manager at WEAC for Environmental Justice. Uh, given the time constraints, WEAC has also submitted written testimony as well. Uh, WEAC is proud members of both the Player Fair Coalition, Player, the Play Fair Coalition and Forest for All New York City Coalition. Uh, WEAC is calling on the mayor and the city council to dedicate 1% of the city's budget to New York City Parks Department so that New Yorkers can finally secure equitable 21st century park system they deserve and commit funding for a robust multi-agency planning process to create a citywide New York City urban forest plan. Due to historic disinvestment and structural racism, such as redlining, our park screen space and access to the city's waterfront are not equitably distributed. Access to green space is on average much lower in environmental justice neighborhoods that are already plagued by adverse health problems and high levels of pollution. New York City Parks does not have the resources it needs to provide access to quality green spaces and infrastructure in every neighborhood. Even though Mayor Adams promised, uh, I'm sorry, even though Mayor Adams proposed austerity cuts fell short of what was originally expected, only full restoration of the park's budget will allow the department staff to adequately care for New York City's green spaces. Uh, Mayor Adams cuts to New York City Parks is short-sighted planning and a, dis um, and a disservice to New Yorkers who rely on parks not only to improve neighborhood resiliency, but as spaces for play, joy, and connection to nature. Uh, further, we urge you to save the roles of 100 city, park, city parks workers that will lose their positions at the end of June and to add 200 city park workers positions to restore staffing to pre-COVID levels. Uh, CPWs uh, help clean our parks which enable more access to trees and green space. Uh, public, sector, public sector jobs have created pathways to the middle class for many black families to build wealth and economic stability that have never existed before, granting them equal access to decent pay, good health care, pension benefits, and job stability. Head cuts to vacancies and hiring freezes on these very jobs that deliver these benefits to an, other, to an otherwise underserved community, the which largely makes up the public workforce, uh, one more line, is detrimental. Now, when Mayor Adams was running for the position he was elected to, he publicly committed to increasing the park's budget uh, to 1% of the total city budget, uh, which would mean that nearly a billion dollars annually. Since then, he has continuously cut funding for park's budget. Uh, advocates want the mayor to fulfill his campaign promise. For some, it was the only reason they even voted for him. Uh, we need the city council to hold Mayor Adams accountable uh, and push back on these short-sighted budget cuts. You cannot accept an adopted budget that does not include 1% funding for parks. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony of Diana Finch, followed by Jessica Burke. You may begin. 
My name's Diana Finch, and I'm speaking as a board member of the Bronx Park East Community Association, which is a member of the Playfair Coalition. Thank you, Chair Christian, for this hearing. Our neighborhood features two major Bronx parks, the Pelham Parkway Malls connecting Fordham to Pelham Bay, and Bronx Park that contains the Bronx River and contains or borders the Bronx Zoo and New York Botanical Gardens. Our parks are city infrastructure as crucial as roads and bridges, and as in need of maintenance, so essential to our physical and mental health. Their features so significant that our neighborhoods take their names and even identities from them. The New York City Parks Department deserves full funding for maintenance and development of this critical city infrastructure. A few weeks ago, the Bronx Park East Community Association signed up through Partnership for Parks to do Earth Day weekend cleanups in both our parks, including mulching that Flavio, the single gardener responsible for miles of parkland, cannot do alone. We were dismayed to learn that we could only do one of these cleanups because our outreach coordinator is only budgeted now to work one day per weekend. We will work with our much appreciated and very dedicated North Park Bronx Parks Manager, Matt Doran, to figure out a solution to this, and we thank him for offering. But how have we come to a situation where the Parks Department budget is so constrained that the community volunteers, volunteers the Parks Department depends on to supplement a too small underpaid workforce, are restricted from caring for our parks as much as we want to? This makes no sense. Please vote to restore the budget cuts to the Parks Department, and please go beyond to give parks the funding we deserve, at least 1% of the New York City budget. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have Jessica Burke. You may begin. Hello. Um, my name is Jessica Burke. Um, sorry, my video isn't working. You would just think that I had an office to myself, which I do not. Um, I am a member of the Friends of Crocheron and John Golden Park. I'm actually the founding president of the organization. We started in the summer of 2020. We help steward a 62 acre park in Queens, which is the 46th largest in the city. We are one of the 400 plus organizations that are members of the Fair Play Coalition for Parks. We want to thank Chair Krishnan and the committee for holding this important hearing on parks. And we echo what others have said. Parks are a place where people go to find relief and discover a place for happiness. We call for fair play for parks in New York City. As I said, our organization has been operating since the summer of 2020. We have had a few transitions that became much easier once we cut the middleman out, partnerships for parks. While the traditional parkies that existed before this public-private partnership was pushed so strongly in the 1980s, that has now created a two-tier system of funding have been great. The Partnerships for Parks employees have not been so great. Partnerships for Parks staff and leadership has failed our volunteers and organizational leaders time and time again. Financially, according to their own webinar, City Parks Foundation, a $24 million organization, takes 10% from groups that have them as their fiscal sponsor, aka their bank. While other nonprofits like ours that works with FJC are only asked to give 5%. City Parks Foundation also promotes that grants that they provide be then funneled back into their nonprofit, saying, hey, hire a City Parks Foundation worker to pay for graphics and website design. Like, there aren't enough graphic designers in the city Thank you. that Your time would benefit has from this. Sorry. Um, so yes, we believe that there are, are better ways to do this than to use a public-private partnership that has that a public-private partnership that has proven to not be beneficial. We also received straight up bad advice from partnerships for parks, saying yes, photograph children without their parents' consent, or yes, you should pay twenty-five dollars for event permits which ironically I did research on my own and City Parks Foundation had put out in a publication for other city parks districts to say, start your own volunteer group. You guys can give them free permits. We have the best Once park again, administrator. Your time has expired. The absolute best. 
Excuse me? Oh, okay. Your, your so yes, um, I just hope that we stop this public-private partnership push or else that we make it disgustingly transparent as Paul Vallone helped us realize in 2020 that partnerships for parks, I'm uh, sorry, City Parks Foundation was receiving 20K for allowing permits. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, number seven, uh, Tammy, Tammy Lynn Mogus. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Tammy Lynn Mogus, and I'm the interim director of the Nature Conservancy's New York City program. The Nature Conservancy is the world's largest conservation organization. We have 90,000 members across New York State, 35,000 of whom reside in New York City. The Nature Conservancy in New York is a member of the Playfair Coalition, and we're also a leading member and convener force for NYC, a coalition of nearly 140 organizational members, many of whom are also providing testimony today. Forest for see works together to increase investment in the urban forest and to expand the tree canopy cover from 22% to 30% citywide by 2035 in an equitable manner. I'm here today to express support for growing the New York City Parks budget to 1% of the total city budget and to commit full funding to the New York City Urban Forest. Thank you to Committee Chair Krishnan and the members of the Parks and Rec Committee for the opportunity to speak about these issues. I won't be able to offer my testimony in two minutes and have submitted a longer written testimony. We commend the city's previous commitments to parks and the urban forest, including Mayor Adams' pledge to increase New York City's parks funding to 1% of the total budget, and the unanimous council passage of two historic bills last fall that mandated the city's first urban forest plan and requiring the city to consider the roles of trees and tree canopy in its long-term sustainability planning. However, the recent cuts in the FY24 budget and the proposed additional cuts in the FY25 budget are not in line with these commitments. To support the care and growth of the urban forest, as well as clean, safe, and accessible parks, the New York City Parks Department needs consistent, sufficient, and baseline funding for both capital and operations needs. This includes ending the hiring freeze now and restoring funding to pre-COVID levels. Furthermore, to ensure the requirements of Local Law 148 are on track, we strongly encourage committing funding for the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice as the lead agency to develop the New York City Urban Forest Plan by the legally mandated due date of July 2025, which is just shy of a year from now. The Nature Conservancy is proud to join with hundreds of diverse organizations from across the city to call for 1% for parks expired. and full funding. Thank you to the committee chair and members of the Parks Committee for considering the benefits of parks and urban forests as you continue to work on the next city budget. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tammy, and to the Forest for All Coalition. Uh, next, we have Lynn Kennedy. You may begin. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Lynn Kennedy, and I represent the Friends of Astoria Heights Park. Um, we are a member of the Playfair uh, for a Parks Coalition, which includes over 400 organizations from across the five boroughs, and many of whom you have heard testify today. We are proud to testify with them as well. We thank the City Council Committee and Parks Chair, Krishnan, for holding this hearing, as well as other Parks Committee members. Um, I am the co-founder of the Friends of Astoria Heights Park, which is a group of volunteers from the neighborhoods surrounding the park, located at 46th Street and 30th Road in Astoria and adjacent to Middle School IS-10. Our group has been in existence since 2013 when we began advocating with our electeds for a safer and more beautiful park space. We are the recipients of funding that allowed for renovation of the park space and reopened in May 2018. We received $2.2 million on behalf of Mayor de Blasio at that time through the CPI initiative and Parks Without Borders programs, $1.5 million from the Department of Environmental Protection and $1.1 million from Councilmember Costantinidis and $1 million from the Borough President Melinda Katz to make this project possible. So that's pretty amazing, but it does have to be maintained. The park remains as heavily utilized as ever in our densely populated neighborhood, and since COVID, even more so as it serves as a hub for many to relax, exercise, socialize, serving as a small and yet vital green oasis in the otherwise cemented urban environment. Recently, with less staffing and oversight, we have seen more litter, more dogs, broken equipment, and vandalism, amongst other safety issues, including some violence that happened last year to one of our parents. The um, 
positives though of having had funding for it's our park expired. more program for for our youth um, clean areas to sit walk maintained and safer bathrooms and an increased positive morale from having parks department support and safety we cannot afford to lose any park space especially in our district which falls short of the citywide average of green acreage we also cannot afford to let parks lapse into another 25 to 30 year cycle of neglect as is what happened prior to the friends group advocacy in 2013. The Friends of Astoria Heights Park joins with others in demanding the mayor hold true to his promise. Your time has expired. Thanks so much and good luck. Thank you. Jennifer Cito. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Seda, and I'm the volunteer program assistant at the Bronx River Alliance. I am providing a testimony on behalf of the Bronx River Alliance about the proposed budget and the importance of restoring full funding to our parks. I'm also speaking on the behalf of Nicole Martel, the chair of the Bronx River Alliance, founder and director of Loving the Bronx and a lifelong Bronx net. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. In 2024, New York City Parks has fewer workers than it did before the pandemic, despite increased demand and clear need for these spaces and thousands few workers than it had a decade ago. The budget cuts to NYC Parks this year and the proposed budget for next year jeopardize the very heart of our communities and threaten the progress that has been made along the Bronx River. The nearly 55 million in proposed cuts will make it even more difficult for the already understaffed, under-resourced parks department to carry out the basic work needed to ensure parks are equitable and accessible for all New Yorkers. Today, the Bronx River Alliance stands with all those who are calling for the city to play fair and to fully reinstate funds that were cut from the parks um, budget. Specifically, we ask you to allocate 1% of the city budget for NYC parks, we ask you to prioritize funding for parks as they are a critical infrastructure. We ask you to provide New Yorkers a park system that is safe, clean, green, and resilient. And we ask you to hold Mayor Adams accountable for committing to allocating 1% of the city budget for NYC parks. New York City parks are at a tipping point. With a proposed budget that will result in nearly a thousand few parks workers, we, parks needs more PEP officers, city workers, gardeners, cleaning core workers, not less. New Yorkers and our beloved parks deserve better than trash playgrounds, delayed um, activities on sprinklers. Thank you so much. A miss unpre unprecedented summer heat, long-term bathroom closures, and neglected tree canopy in the midst of climate crisis. Parks are critical to our public health and safety and drive and drivers of social equity. They should be funded as such. Thank you again for your leadership and for the opportunity to express the Bronx River support for increased investment in New York City parks. Sincerely and on the behalf of Noka Martel and the board of directors of the Bronx River Alliance. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Now we have Subin Kim. Good begin. afternoon. Oh, sorry. Um, good afternoon, my name is Subin Kim and I am a former intern under both the Natural Areas Conservancy and in New York City Parks affiliate, the Greenbelt Native Plant Center. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I would like to voice additional support for the Playfair campaign and allocating 1% of the city budget to the New York City Parks Department and alleviating its historically underfunded resourcing. Uh, I would also like to voice support in restoring the $2.4 million originally set aside for the Trails Formalization Program as well as in pushing for the permanent establishment of many of New York City Park's seasonal, seasonal lines, such as those in forestry management and urban park rangers, which are, as mentioned, currently set to expire this summer. I strongly believe our parks are a valuable avenue for increasing equity in the city. They provide spaces for fellow New Yorkers to foster a sense of community and compassion for nature. Furthermore, they act as one of our leading defenses against excessive heat and flooding which are compounded by our high concentration of impervious infrastructure. As such, in these unprecedented times of the climate extremes, it is more crucial than ever that these areas remain hospitable and efficiently maintained. Additionally, on a more personal note, being a recent graduate in the environmental sciences, I am well acquainted with the pervasive concerns of job insecurity among those entering the field. 
as we emerging professionals inherit responsibility for the land around us, as well as the people who rely on it, it's my hope that the heightened need for green jobs is properly acknowledged and an accessible environmental workforce is promoted during these next critical decades. Thank you very much for your time and to the City Council for their past and current advocacy for New York City's natural areas. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, and before we go further, I do want to also welcome, I know we have our esteemed, amazing State Senator John Liu, Another brother from Queens who is doing great work for us. I know his government finance class from Columbia. Uh, it's such an honor to have you all here. Uh, and uh, we are about three quarters of the way through our budget hearings for our city council with the mayor's, what they call the preliminary budget. So it's his first proposal. Uh, then we have our negotiate, we have our hearings. We have more negotiations. He'll come out with his next uh, revised budget based on our negotiations in May uh, with the final budget due at the end of June, June 30th by city charter. So what you're hearing today is uh, we've had a number of, a lot of hearings from different committees over the course of the last month. And today uh, we have our parks committee hearing which started at one o'clock. We heard testimony from the parks commissioner uh, and their leadership team. Uh, and now we're hearing testimony from the public, both in person and virtual. Uh, and what we're really pushing on here, and I find as the parks chair, from Jackson Heights and Elmers, where we have some of the least amount of park space in New York City, unacceptable is that Mayor Adams campaigned on a budget of 1% for our parks, 1% of our city budget. So for a $100 billion budget, roughly over a billion dollars for parks. Instead, we are seeing a number of cuts to our parks department in the last year, over 700 positions cut uh, as a result of these different rounds of cuts. And we, as a city council, find that unacceptable and our getting testimony about the impacts of those cuts, what it'll mean for maintenance services in our parks. Uh, at one point, we had another program that was cut before by the mayor in the fall that we fought back and restored that supports our parks workers. So today we've heard a lot of testimony about not only are we so far moving backwards from 1% of our city budget for parks, but we are facing a number of massive cuts that affect our, our workers, that affect park services, at a time when we know how important our parks are across the city for our health, for our well-being, and at a time when so many, every other major city in America invests more than 1% of their budget for parks. So we are not in good shape for a mayor who, again, campaigned on increasing funding for parks significantly. So with that in mind, welcome. It's great to have you all here. You've got an amazing professor and Professor Lou, uh, and uh, it's, uh, thank you for stopping by our hearing today. Now we'll go back to our virtual witnesses. We now have uh, Marieko Bender. Hello. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You may begin. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilman Krishnan and, and council members for holding this hearing. Um, sorry about my video. I'm getting an error message here. Let's see. Can you speak a bit louder? Sorry, we can't hear you too well. Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you. We have, video, we have audio. All right. Thank you all very much for holding this hearing um, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Marika Bender. Um, I'm a mem member of the Forest for All Coalition, and my work centers on educating park goers on the importance of a healthy tree canopy and the importance of stewarding our green spaces. I worked in national city and state parks over the course of my career, but today I'm speaking on my own behalf as a New Yorker who loves our parks. I have been spending time in New York City parks for my whole life, and I can see that our city is doing so much to protect our neighborhoods from the impacts of climate change um, and to protect these incredibly important green spaces, but we have a long way to go. We need trees and green spaces in our city, and this isn't a luxury or a frivolous request. Our climate is warming, and the shade from well-developed mature tree canopies protects our most vulnerable from the impacts of urban heat island effect. Um, urban heat island effect is um, heat islands are urbanized areas that experience higher temperatures than outlying areas. There's a lot of pavement, a lot of heat, and there's not a lot of shade. As has been the case historically and continues today, non-white low income neighborhoods bear the brunt of this effect. Um, without appropriate resources, which the proposed budget cuts would curtail, we cannot keep our parks and green spaces thriving for the public and we create a dangerous environment for people who live without them. 
New York City is falling behind other major cities the world over by proposing to disinvest from our parks. Um, I live in a neighborhood that's been historically underserved and we don't have the parks and tree cover that wealthier, more privileged neighborhoods Your time have. has expired. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, now we have Georgia Silvera Siemens. You may begin. Uh, hello, good afternoon. I uh, would like to thank you, Chair Krishnan and council members on the Parks Committee. I am representing Washington Square Park Eco Projects, an initiative of Local Nature Lab. Uh, we offer biodiversity and nature programming in the park. And we're also members of the Force for All New York City and Playfair for Parks coalitions. We need more than making do and relying on volunteers in tough times for a world-class park system to flourish. The city must dedicate itself to funding public parkland which is 14% of the city's land area. A 1% budget is the bare minimum if we want a 21st century parks department. I will focus on urban heat and tree canopy for the remainder of my remarks. On May 28th, 2022, the New York Times published an article titled, It's Going to Be a Hot Summer. It Will Be Hotter If You're Not Rich. And I'm quoting here from the article, which says, in the Bronx, vegetation covers 63% of wealthy Riverdale, several neighborhoods to the south in low-income Mott Haven, only 18% is green, which affects temperature. A fully funded parks department could mitigate this, mitigate this injustice. On July 27th of last year, the mayor's office released a transcript for Mayor Eric Adams's briefing to discuss New York's city's heat advisory. And this is a quote. As we saw with COVID during the pandemic, extreme heat also does impact all people equally, does not impact all people equally. Black New Yorkers, New Yorkers of color are twice as likely to die from heat related causes as white New Yorkers. We are taking actions like installing cool roofs and committing to a 30% tree canopy cover. A fully funded parks department can help New York City achieve it's 30% canopy cover good. Uh, the final quote, urban parks provide important midday cooling and cooling benefits from street trees, uh, which are found to occur around 6 or 7 p.m. and after sunset. A fully funded parks department can create street tree networks and park systems that keep our city cooler during climate change fueled extreme heat events. And I will say again, the city must dedicate itself to funding public park land, which is 14% of its land area. A 1% budget is the bare minimum if we want a 21st century parks department. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last two virtual, Susan Lippman, uh, followed by, well, well, Susan Lippman. You may begin. Susan Lippman. You may begin, Susan. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just calling it as an individual um, senior and lover of pork. So just, just for a minute, because this is, um, we can't have any more cuts to park. So, and thank you for doing this. Uh, yeah, parks are fundamental to mental and physical health, relaxation, sense of community. Deterioration of our parks will undoubtedly result from funding cuts and will increase crime, where as maintenance of parks and evening activities will substantially decrease crime. And that has been well documented. And there are already too few healthy activities for our youth, especially during the summer months. Organized sports activities in parks can do a lot to provide healthy recreation and keep kids out of trouble and keep our city safer for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Susan. And our last in uh, a virtual witness is uh, Demi uh, Amadeno. You may begin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good 
Um, I am a employee, and I want to thank the council for allowing us to speak for our that we love so dearly. It's a bit hard to hear you. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, that's better. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I just um, wanted to say thank you again for um, the city council for their one-shot funding of Playfair Lines Up Parks. However, these employment lines um, desperately need to be baselined and added to the annual budget in our natural resource group every year. Over 50 staff don't know if they'll have a job on July 1st, and they don't find out until a week or two before then. This is not a proper way to really run a city agency that cares about its employees who have bills and families, and this circumstances force people to look for new jobs and leave our agency. Um, as a result, it leaves the rest of us having to pick up some all the work, and we experience high turnover rates and lose invaluable institutional knowledge and talent. Trees and restoration take time, and we need professionals invested in this field. As you can imagine, this puts our agency at a disadvantage, uh, constantly having to scramble for new staff and train them and constantly onboard them. It doesn't have to be like this because $2.5 million towards these employment lines can transform our capacity at parks to maintain healthier forests and wetlands that New Yorkers deserve. It will offer the job security people need to live healthy and safe lives, and it's time the city invests in its green workforce as it is promised. Thank you again, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we're going to read through the witnesses who were here uh, on virtual uh, before. Bet before. Betsy Silverman. Babby Dunnington. Faye Hill. Daniel Rennells. Elizabeth York. Meredith Thompson. Olga Cotto. Oh, Meredith Thompson. We'll call you in one second to in person. Sure. Olga Cato, Ruth Dariana Cabrera, Samir Lavengia, and Sirio Guarino. That's our virtual witnesses. Now we'll go back to in person uh, Meredith Thompson and also uh, Rosalie Fletcher. You may begin, Meredith. Hi, Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for, for hearing us today. Um, my name is Meredith Thompson. I'm uh, a resident of Council District 37. I'm a parks employee and a natural area super steward volunteer in my spare time. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land that we are here fighting to continue caring for today is the ancestral homeland of the Lenny Lenape people, um, the original caretakers of what is now New York City. Um, we are standing here in front of you today in person and in virtually um, to ask the city council to permanently fund the care for this land because we acknowledge that it is our responsibility and ours alone to do so. Um, the time scales uh, between humans and trees differ by an order of magnitude. As such, our work must operate according to both time scales. We simply cannot do our jobs if our funding is not permanently stable. Every single one of our natural areas needs ma uh, management and care, for example, uh, a restoration project for the forest uh, requires at least five years worth of skilled work on the land, let alone the pre-planning needed to facilitate the project. Um, a single restoration site needs to be researched and prepared by foresters, crew leads, and skilled gardeners, cleared uh, of truckloads of debris and other things, um, invasive plants, uh, underground seed banks by the gardeners, um, the trees gr uh, grown by nurseries and ordered by foresters, volunteers educated and mobilized by the stewardship team, uh, trees planted and cared for by, by volunteers and gardeners, and most importantly, trees cared about by the park patrons who were brought together in community by us, uh, park employees. Uh, this doesn't even cover the ongoing endangered species monitoring and ecosystem assessments completed by ecologists, uh, of which I'm one, um, or the innovative pilot projects designed, by, uh, designed to improve our knowledge of and land um, and protocols for the land we benefit from. Uh, simply put, our, simply, our, our city cannot afford to lose Playfair funding, not for one year and not ever. If you uh, and the, the city council are able to vote f to uh, fund Playfair permanently, um, I can promise you we will be here doing everything in our human power to help protect and care for the city's residents, human and non-human, every year for the future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for your work on behalf of our parks across the city.
Hello. Um, good afternoon. My name is Rosamund Fletcher, and I'm executive director of the Fort Greene Park Conservancy. We are a proud member of the Playfair for Parks Coalition. Thank you, uh, Chair Christian, for holding this hearing. Uh, in case you haven't had the pleasure of spending time in Fort Greene Park, I'll share a bit of information. At 30 acres, the historic Olmsted Park is neither large nor small, but it is well used and well loved. The park is located in the heart of Fort Greene, Brooklyn, and directly adjacent to the ever-expanding downtown Brooklyn. The density and growth of the area over the last decade has dramatically increased use of the park by people and dogs. As the stewardship partner of the park, we welcome this use, but we have to contend with the impacts, like erosion of the park's hills, which requires intensive seasonal lawn rotation and restoration, and the overflowing garbage cans, which require constant day and evening trash pickups. The park's heavy use demands additional resources that we happily provide, as well as adequate park staffing. We filled the staffing gap during the pandemic, but our role is not to alleviate the city from its responsibility to staff the agency. Our role is to provide complementary services. Fort Green Park Conservancy stands with all Playfair Coalition members in demanding that the mayor end the hire free, hiring freeze now, restore positions lost to this freeze, and return to the pre-COVID headcount. To provide further context, the area north of Fort Green Park is an environmental justice zone and now state-designated disadvantaged community with over 12,000 residents living in public housing, 36% below the poverty line. In stark contrast, the areas south of Fort Green Park boast a median income of 118,000. At its best, when well cared for on all sides, the park transcends these disparities, bringing people together, community members in joy and celebration, to chill out on the sunny hills, to barbecue on Ju Juneteenth. Our mission supports Fort Green Park as a public gathering space for events large and small to enrich the park through community organizing, arts, and culture. And we benefited last year as a second shift park. That was so important to us. But this is threatened. During the height of the programming season, we rely on park staff to help us and other community partners navigate the hilly terrain for event setup and takedown. And as we enter the spring season, the budget cuts have forced us to have hard conversations with our New York City Parks partner about limiting our programs and events. This would be devastating to all community members who benefit from the park's offerings and our cultural partners who rely on the park as a venue. Imagine less Chinese and Spanish film nights, less dance with kumbe workshops, less jazz fests. This would be an incredible loss. In summary, we need adequate star staffing in Fort Greene Park and in all parks. New York City should not shirk from its responsibility to fund its park system. We demand 1% now. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and for your work. Uh, I want to say thank you, everyone who has come today, for all your testimony to our parks department. And I look forward to continuing our work together to make sure we get a budget that actually funds our parks at the level it deserves. Thank you all so much, and that concludes today's hearing.